uh, where we just confirmed. Okay. Mayor, we are ready whenever you are to begin. All right. So we're, are we uh, broadcasting? Yes, we are. All right, great. Let's go ahead and uh, call the uh, 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 Tuesday, July 14th, 2020 uh, regular session to order. If we can go ahead and start with roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. I'll come back to her. Council Member Doggo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Oh, you can't unmute. I see you there. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. And Council Member Christensen is in attendance, um, just stepped away to wash her face. So she should be right back. Great. All right. Well, Council Member Rodrigo Ferry, you want to start us in the pledge, please? Sure. Are we ready? <laughs> ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, and, liberty and, justice and, justice and justice for all. I think that was probably the best pledge we've had on, on Zoom for a while. So been doing morning pledge with my class I, I, the last 25 you, years. You, you might be our go-to go -to person. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, briefly remind people that anyone wishing to speak during first call public invited to be heard or in a public hearing under item nine, you will need to watch the live stream of the meeting. Um, there will be these instructions for how to call in to provide comment. Um, they will be displayed again, just like they are being now at the appropriate time. Comments are limited to three minutes each. I will be timing and I'll cut you off if you hit the three minute mark, no matter how awesome your comments are terrible. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to item three. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the June 30th, 2020 regular session? Minutes. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Council Member uh, Martin, or I'm sorry, Council Member uh, Martin uh, went ahead and made the motion. Dr. Waters seconded it. Is there any debate or changes? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries six uh, with six of us, four, and Council Member Christensen um, absent, therefore abstaining. Um, all right, let's go on to agenda revisions and submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items. Is there anything, Council Member Peck? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I know that we've been this uh, through this before, but I wanna revisit a motion we made earlier. Um, and if we do not reconvene in July, in the council chambers, um, I want to move to direct staff to add the second reading of Metro districts to the first regular session in August. I'll second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any debate or discussion? All right, uh, Councilman Waters. Um, I'm going to vote against the motion. I think it's a bad idea to get that out ahead of, of bringing people back together again, unless unless I unless there's something in the queue, something to come before us that's an, an application for a metro district. And I, what, I guess what, I wonder what the point is before we create an opportunity for people to weigh in the second time around. People in this case, the public. So I just I, I don't think there's a need to rush it. Uh, so I'll vote against it. All right, seeing no, oh, Council Member Peck. I just would like to address that. Uh, Council Member uh, Waters, I don't feel that it's rushing it since it is the second reading and we have had uh, input since about October or November of 2018 on this uh, issue. So from both sides, from every side, from professionals, from developers, from residents, from staff, um, so that's why I'm making the motion. It is the second reading and I don't feel that we are rushing it. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and take the vote or we can keep debating it, but I would, I, I would recommend Council Member Martin and Council Member Waters count their votes, but we can keep discussing it. Council Member Martin. I would just like to say that it seems premature to me because the economy will change 
and um, we already know the economy is changing and it doesn't seem to be um, appropriate to make it difficult to amend a situation where um, you know, we just don't know what the needs of the city are going to be in a year. That's all. I'm going to vote against it and I don't care whether it prevails or not. I'm still going to vote against it. I call the question. Yeah, that, that, that's not what I meant, Councilmember Martin. I was saying is what I was saying is that, that you had the winning votes for just a few seconds. Um, welcome back, Councilmember Christensen. Uh, Councilmember Waters, did you want to say something else? All right, let's go ahead and uh, there's no further debate on the matter. So let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, well, time out, time out, time out. Point order, point order. I'm calling on myself. <laughs> All right, Councilmember Christensen, welcome back. While you were gone, there was a motion made by Councilmember Peck to bring back the uh, issue on, on Metro districts to the first regular session that we're in council chambers. No. Should, what was it again? Um, how, how, uh, we are bringing it back. Uh, we, according to staff, we should be able to go into council chambers in July. At what point the metro districts would come back? However, given a situation where we cannot because of the virus, I am asking that we bring it back in the first regular session in August. Regardless. In case, yeah, in case we can't bring it back in July, I would like us to not keep putting it off. Bring it so, back. Up. So, the, the, even even if we're on WebEx still or Zoom. Exactly. Okay. Um, anyway, that was moved and seconded. Councilmember Christensen. Okay. Um, yes, I'm in favor of this. We've we've been talking about this since November of last year. We've heard from everybody in the world, developers. We've had special sessions on this. And before that, we talked about it for the previous year. So I do think this is just an up-down vote. We're on the second uh, hearing, and it's one of the many, many things that we've been putting off. And uh, I would really like to have it come back, yes. So I'll be voting for this. All right. Let's go ahead and take the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. All right. The motion carries five to two with Council Member Waters and Martin um against i have another uh, motion okay councilman peck thank you i know that we discussed this uh, at council comments i think councilman waters brought it up but um i want to move it forward to direct staff to put the rv safe lots on the august 4th study session agenda i would second that and what what, what and what did you just to, to hear about it councilman peck Yes, to uh, see, to ask staff if we can uh, get input from them as to whether they can be ready to bring it back on a regular session. I know that we can't, um, I'm not sure we're ready to vote on it, but I would like to I have an update on it at the study session and an update perhaps from Hope who is doing this and uh, see then if we want to move forward on a regular session. Right. Does that makes. sense? Yep, it does. Councilmember Waters? Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. I, I did express concerns about the RV ordinance, and um, and I'm, it's been almost 11 months uh, since we gave direction to staff to bring the the ordinance on RV parking back to the council. And uh, and I and I said then, and I will say again, I understand why it's been delayed because of the safe lot discussions, but I just need some clarification. Uh, it's my understanding that the the hope proposal did not include RVs, and the city, whatever whatever conversation the city's been in, does not include RVs in terms of safe lots. Uh, so if if I'm mistaken, then I'll then I'll stand corrected. But I think that's what I heard when we heard these presentations a few months ago. So if 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 there are no RV safe lots in the queue for either hope or um, the city, I, then I wonder what we're gonna do on in a study session. Uh, Councilman Waters, thank you for bringing that up. The whole point of the study session from my perspective is to actually uh, discuss that with, the, with HOPE, what they need, because they, they have been mentioning that uh, this is an issue. And that, that is actually why we had some of those special sessions uh, the summer of 2018, I think it was and safe lots both for RVs and for cars came up. 
So um, I, this would be nothing more than a presentation uh, as to where we are from Jeff Satter with RVs, because we've all had emails, et cetera, that the, that, that is a, becoming a big problem again. And um, Hope has expressed the need for RV uh, safe lots. So for me, it is, it is a, a presentation as to where are we, do we need them, what are they, et cetera. Councilor Waters? Um, well, I would, vote, I would vote to support your, your direction to staff if it was about more than safe lots, if it's the ordinance as, as part of the discussion of where we are with the ordinance. But to bring that, since we gave direction once upon a time, to bring the ordinance back, uh, certainly safe lots would be could would fold in or spin out of a discussion on the ordinance. But uh, but to discuss RVs or have a presentation on RVs once having given direction to staff to come back and review the ordinance, I'd rather use that time to read the ordinance and then what relationship safe lots or RV might have in relationship to an ordinance. Personally, do you want to amend the uh, motion then? If if you'll accept a friendly amendment, then I would amend or I would move that we amend the motion to include the beginning review of the ordinance and the relationship of whatever we do with the ordinance to safe lots or RVs or any other consideration. Okay, sounds good to me. Yeah. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I would, I guess I'd second that too. Um, uh, Councilman Waters, I, I was con a little confused about this too because I believe that Hope has been reconsidering this, uh, what what they were doing. Originally, Safe Lots was going to include some cars and a few RVs, and now they've sort of split off, it's my understanding, and they are opening a, par, a car only lot, but the, um, the Safe Lot would, all, would be, I believe, for uh, RVs which are, as we all know, a continuing problem. And so I, I, I also was very confused about this for the, and, and <laughs> for the last few months. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would support this. Council Mayor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I have a question for Assistant City Manager Marsh, who I believe the last time we discussed this had an idea about leasing land um, from the county at the fairgrounds. Um, before we set a date for this, should we uh, see whether that's gone anywhere? Just because she's here. Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin, you're correct. We did have that conversation around the opportunity for the Boulder County Fairgrounds RV uh, campground. Um, I think there are some pretty significant limitations on how many days that folks can actually use that facility. Um, but certainly I could speak with uh, Karen Roney and see if we could talk to the county about options for their uh, RV lot over there. And I don't know if we have done that today. Okay, it'd be great to uh, to have that when this comes back. And uh, if if we can know that one way or the other, then then that would certainly inform the debate. Okay. Thank you. Brian, you're muted. I, you, read, <laughs> you, you have you, rarely you read, muted you, yourself. You, I know, I, but uh, yeah, I, I said, Councilmember Christensen. <laughs> I, I lip read. <laughs> um, so Joni, if we're going to talk to them about um, the fairgrounds, why don't we talk to them about Alaska as well? Because that's a possibility that somehow has gotten lost in the shuffle and I'm very, uh, we're very interested in um, making use of that facility, uh, which is now being just wasted. So, thank you. Well, I guess the other question is, Harold, I guess my question is, would that be something that would push you guys off at all with your time frame if we did this on the 4th? Um, I know that they've met and we and Ellie Berto and the group met a couple of weeks ago. Um, to continue this. So I think we can come back and provide um, 
updates and go over timelines and what we had discussed. So I think that's reasonable. All right, then the question is, um, uh, we're asking for city staff, so the motion is to bring back uh, the ordinance for discussion on the 4th of August. So all in favor say aye. 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 Now I say that's assuming the world doesn't change on this. Correct. All <laughs> opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Anything else, Councilmember Peck? No, thank you, Mayor Bagley. All right, seeing nobody else, let's go ahead and move on with... Uh, Me? Yeah, city manager's report. I was trying to be fancy <laughs> with my space bar. It doesn't yeah. work. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't use it either. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you all, talk about a couple of things. Um, to, then turn it over to Jim to give a, a financial update. Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can. A yes. map with a lot of colors. Um, so generally, this is the John Hopkins uh, website that really talks about um, what's happening um, in terms of around the country. Um, to give you a sense, this is one of the sites that I look at. Um, to show you what kind of data you can get off of this, I'm going to go to the county where my mom lives. Um, and you can see uh, they've had one death, 108 cases. They were really, for the longest time, sitting at around 30 cases. Um, this has really been something that they've seen an increase within the last few weeks in terms of their location. I think the one thing that you really see that this map really highlights um, is, is really what you're starting to hear. Um, in terms of uh, what you're hearing out of the state of Texas in terms of hospital capacity, what you're hearing out of Florida, um, I believe Louisiana, and you can see where those increases are coming. We've all heard about Arizona um, in, in California in terms of what that's looking like in, in terms of those cases. Um, I say this because um, when we say, if the world doesn't change, uh, one of the things that's really been interesting to me over the last few days is, is when you look at some of the things that are happening in some of these states. So obviously in California, um, the governor has, uh, and they're doing this by county, but there's only a few counties that didn't fall under this in, in California where basically um, have a li limited a number of services that were open and moved um, restaurant services to outdoor dining only eliminated some of the um, personal services that were going on. Um, and, and so you see that in California. What's interesting is if you said, well, what state's probably the opposite of that? It is Texas. Um, and the governor of Texas recently came out, issued a masking order, um, and then in, in a lot of his interviews basically said, we've got to get these numbers under control. Um, if we don't get these numbers under control, I'm going to have to go back and issue another stay-at-home order. So there's a there's a big thing occurring here in this location. Um, Saw cities, Houston, Dallas, and that area, um, starting to say the same thing, again, seeing it in Florida. And, and so I say this because, you know, I talked to you all last time about the numbers and what impact the numbers really have in terms of how we continue to move forward. Um, and there's some anxiousness from a, a long-term um, perspective in terms of what happens in those those other jurisdictions, what that means to the national economy, how that could potentially impact us, and what that means to um, really how we look at the 2021 budget. Um, and, and so to, to go from here, I'm going to show you what's happening in the state. So on this slide, these are by reported date and by count. Some people will say, well, if you go to this website, this looks different. Um, I toggled off of the three-day moving average to say, what does it look like on a daily basis? And so what you can see, um, again, is the peak. You can see the decline. You can see these secondary peaks that occurred, kind of hit this point here, where at low point, there's about 100. This is the state of Colorado. 115 cases reported on June 13th. Um, you slide over here to July 9th, 620 cases, and you're seeing this drop again in this chart. Um, if you want to see what the three-day moving average looks like, it'll take a little bit to uh, refresh the screen. Um,
sorry. Again, what you're seeing is this is a, a smoother curve, but you're seeing sort of the same thing occur, but the three day moving average, when you take this high point, it's drawing it up. So that's why I tend to, um, to look at the case counts. Um, and those are the individual cases uh, that come into play. And my computer's freezing. So the other chart uh, back here. So again, this is what it looks like with the case counts. The other chart that I wanted to go over, um, and, and just I'll stop here when you look at number of deaths, you can definitely see the decline. You can see that we've actually had some days where we haven't had any, or um, you know, for the most part, it's been below five. Um, when you go to this chart, so this is the positivity data. And so what you really look at in this is when you go to this point here, um, you can see that the percent positive in the number of tests was a 2.34%. Um, when you look at this, it's risen to 4.84% um, as we've had more tests being produced. Uh, and then it's at 425 so this is sort. These are the numbers that they're looking at when you see a lot of those uh, executive orders, and you hear the governor talk about this and what the transmission rate is going to look like, uh, and what that looks like. So now I'll take you to um, Boulder County. Um, when you look at Boulder County, again, attention, pay the scale here. Uh, you can see this this high point here. You can see this high point, which we all talked about what occurred um, in Boulder on the hill. You can see the de decrease. But then you can see the cases starting to bounce again. Um, and then we have another peak at about 25 cases in, in Boulder, Boulder County. When you slide to this, this is a five day rolling average percentage of COVID-19 PCR test. Um, again, you can see the curve moving where we want, um, but I think Again, what you saw in the statewide data is you see this dip and then you see the move up um, and then you start to see it move up again. Uh, you know, I'm, I want to talk to Jeff to see how much of that is really um, a product of the fourth and what we saw. Again, this is the total number of testing. So when you look at testing capacity, you do see that in, in Boulder County, we do have the ability to hit that 500 test capacity. Uh, that they talk about in, in what we need to hit. We've obviously hit around 650 on a couple of occasions. Um, in the most recent number, we, got, we went above 500. So, you know, that's again a good sign. Uh, this is the new cases on the five day average. So, again, you see this peak that occurred that, that we talked about that occurred in Boulder. But again, you're seeing this this other peak occur as we were starting to move down in somewhat of a similar fashion as what we did before, uh, but we've, we've bounced back up. So those are the things that when we talk about moving in to protect our neighbor that comes into play that we have to watch. Um, this is again, another interesting one. So I've been sort of showing you what's happening in these two communities in between Boulder and Longmont. So if you remember, we really hit that 500 number much earlier um, and then we held it around 530. We've now moved to 568. Um, Boulder was catching up to us, and now um, they're um, ahead of us, you know, by by 20 um, individuals. It's in this number, so you can you can see what we're starting to see in terms of the tracing and when they talk about uh, the events that are occurring in other locations. The other piece that's really interesting to us that we're starting to see, and I want to dig into this a little bit more, um, is if you remember when we looked at the ethnicity component of this, this was actually closer to 40%. Um, and so what we're seeing is those rise in cases occur. Um, it's actually uh, dropping this percentage here for uh, the Latinx Hispanic population. So we want to dig into that data a little bit more and see what's happening. Um, as we continue to move forward. I think last week it was almost at 38%. Uh, and so now it's at 37. So we're trying to recognize what that, that data looks like uh, and what that's gonna mean for us. Uh, again, you can see, just to let you know, 
um, really heavily, you know, hit hard um, in the orange category, which is uh, associated with long-term care facilities. Um, we didn't see it for a while. Now we're starting to see it again. So those are things that we really want to, to watch for uh, in, in terms of the data. Uh, and then at the end, this really talks to you, this shows you what we're seeing in terms of the hospital piece. Um, you know, again, this is in the red. This is probably a product of elective procedures that we have going on. Um, we saw that it was in the green prior to elective procedures being allowed to occur. Once they were, it moved. Um, and then you can see the, the available ICU beds. I don't know what, on this chart what that looks like in terms of COVID patients. Uh, what I can tell you is um, we've been working with the county on a, um, a data set that we talked to you all about that is taking uh, multiple sources of data and bringing it together that could also be something that we can look at for a leading indicator. Uh, we had the meeting today in terms of bringing staff together and creating the governance structure um, because that data gets pretty specific. Um, and we have to be really careful um, with how it's utilized. Um, we're all bringing um, various individuals from throughout our organization together in, in a user group technical expert setting so they can help advise us in terms of how they would like to use this. But in what I saw today, and I'm going to look at it more tomorrow, um, there's some really good data in terms of what we're seeing that we can start layering that on top of this to get a better understanding of what's happening in the community. So obviously, um, if you remember a slide that Jeff Zayak showed you all, um, Colorado's doing better than most places. Um, I will tell you what's interesting is I was driving across the country for a funeral last week. Um, there were literally locations that I went to where you wouldn't even think uh, that it's occurring. Um, and what's interesting is to see how people are now reacting to that and how the states are reacting to that. So um, I put a list on what I'm tracking in terms of data. This is sort of the data geek in me coming out to really see what are we seeing in those communities now in terms of increases. So again, you know, what I said before, um, what we're now seeing is that all states are really anchoring in on the data. And there are a number of states that are, are starting to pull back, that have pulled back and some are threatening to pull back um, based on what they're seeing in terms of the data and what that's gonna look like. So again, I just encourage everyone as we're doing this to um, you know, wear your mask and, and do what you can with social distancing. We all wanna support our local businesses. We all wanna to continue to be able to enjoy the facilities um, and that's gonna be incredibly important. I say all of this because that's now the lead into Jim and, and how we're looking at the, at the financial situation because um, 2020, we, we've got a good handle on. 2021 is a completely different story. Um, and we're gonna have significant financial issues to deal with in the 2021 budget. Um, so are there any questions for me in terms of the data before I turn it over to Jim? Councilmember, uh, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, um, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Harold, I just, some of the charts that you showed us, it went out to, 710 instead of 714. Was there uh, not a significant increase between 710 and 714 that it wouldn't be on the graph? No, that's the way the data comes in on some of these charts. So some is more real time. So they actually can take you out to the, to the date we're on. Others it's not, and it comes in a little bit later. So some of these charts will lag. Um, and again, these are all charts that anyone can find on the CDPHE website or the Boulder County Health Department's website. So they're really in charge of the data, but there is a lag to some of these. Okay, thank you. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Um, Harold, has there been any discussion on predictions of what would happen once we start opening schools per se? Um, no, I think that's, um, you know, that's an interesting piece right now and, and it's all over the place and you're hearing any number of um, epidemiologists and others come in and weigh in on that conversation. Um, I noticed that Dr. Fauci was one and they had a panel that talked about it. I haven't had a chance to, to read it. Uh, I think the one thing that I am consistently hearing 
in terms of that is really the protocols that are in place, mm -hmm. social distancing, mask wearing, and those types of issues are going to be incredibly important. Um, and I think what they're learning, they're learning new things daily. Mm -hmm. There was a, a recent study that was released um, that talked about um, younger people and, and how, how they respond when they get it. Mm -hmm. um, and really talking about the connection between smoking and vaping. Mm -hmm. And so the younger people that smoke and vape actually can have a really serious um, case. Uh, versus what was typically thought because of the impact on, on, on your lungs. If there was um, an interesting story, and this is kind of why they're really hitting that younger demographic right now. Uh, there was a story, uh, a doctor, I think out of San Antonio, they had a COVID party where really they took someone who was positive yeah. and they were, um, I guess it was to see who would get sick. Uh, and there was a 30 year old that just passed away. Um, he was one of those that got sick. And I think, you know, what they said in the article is one of his last words was, I should have taken this more seriously. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so that's where you're seeing nationally this sort of push on that younger demographic, um, because that is, if you, um, I'll share my screen with you one more time to answer your question. Um, if you look at this, this is in Boulder County. And so when you look at the number of cases, you have this traditional curve. Um, can you all see it or no? Now you can. So if you look at this by age group, you know, you have this, this curve that looks like this, but then you can see that age group of 20 to 29. Um, so look at the state's numbers. I mean, it, it, you know, again, you see this peak in this 20 to 29. I don't know how much of the 10 to 19 is in the, what you would call the 16 to 18 category, but I think that's what you're now starting to hear um, more in, in the public conversations. Okay, and then, so I just, I had an NEA meeting on workers' rights, health and safety, as we're reopening schools. And the message over and over again was the four Ds physical distancing, deterrence, um, disinfection, detection. And it's yep. not an either or, but really it has to be happening throughout. Yep. And anyone who has interaction with the public. So I think if you're out there grocery shopping, think about the four Ds. And that's, I mean, we all play a role in that. In yeah, we do. And, and I had this question from earlier or yesterday on the LADP meeting. Mm -hmm. When I look at the numbers in our organization, we have about a you know, let's say a thousand people that we've had somewhere at home, mm -hmm. um, but you know, thir around 36% of our organization never stopped working. And many of those are police and fire. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last number I had, I've heard is we were below 15 cases as an organization. Okay. Um, and it really is about following those protocols and managing those safe practices to ensure not only the, the safety of, your, of our workforce, but also uh, the residents of our community, you go in there. So we, it looks different. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the things that everyone needs to keep in mind. And something I'm hearing from s different outlets is sometimes three feet is okay if you have a mask. You know, that in our conversations that we've had, I've always heard six feet. You know, unless I was asleep at the wheel somewhere and three feet was slipped in, where, where would that have come from? I don't know. So the, the order from Boulder County is if you can't adequately social distance, which is six feet, then you need to wear a mask. Okay. And that's the county order. So if you're inside of six feet, you need to wear a mask. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Thanks, Harold. Let's go on with Jim Golden. Looks like he's ready. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Jim Golden, the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, last week, late last week, I sent council an uh, email, actually, two emails hopefully you got to see the correction but uh i did give you an update on our may sales and use tax collections in my normal monthly email wanted to now update our our revenue shortfall projections we haven't talked about these in two months we didn't uh, do any any update after the april collections so um in general um we've um We've been, since COVID went into effect, we've gone through about four collection cycles. The first one 
was February, which sales had already taken place, but the collections were due on March 20th. And uh, those came in down 1.5% from the previous February. March was up 6%. April was then down 12.7%. And then last week we saw that May was up 1.6% over May of 2019. So it's after five months now, year to date, we are down 0.6% for our, our total sales and use tax. Um, that's uh, um, breaking down between sales and use taxes. It's a, a growth in sales tax and a large decrease in use tax. We have 2.4% growth in sales tax and a 15.5% drop in use tax. And use taxes has uh, been down in pretty much all of the major areas. Primary employers down the most. Vehicle sales, that's, that's out of town vehicle sales. So those, and they are, there is a difference I think uh, that we, we see in out of town versus in town. And uh, there's, also a, there's also a delay in, the, in the receipt of those monies since they go through the county. As you know, it takes up to 60 days to, to uh, register a vehicle. And sometimes that's when that money is paid versus sometimes right at the sale. So anyway, those are down 22%. And that's pretty significant. And then building permits are down almost 9%. Um, our budget projections for 2020 were that would be up 3.46% over 2019 collections. So even though we're down just six tenths of a percent compared to the previous year, our amount of our, our shortfall underneath budget for total sales and use tax is about $1.2 million after five months. Uh, obviously a lot less than what we were talking about in projections back in, in uh, April and May, but still it's a significant decline. Um, um, May was up 1.6%, but there were two major sales tax audit receipts that we received and that had an impact and we don't receive those type of audits uh, regularly. So it's hard to look at that uh, and consider that in doing projections. So uh, if I back that out, uh, we are actually, we're down 4.8% over the previous May for our, our basically our typical sales and use tax collections. So it, it was a, a strong month, but at the same time, um, what we were projecting is that in uh, that June would be down 28.7%. That's the projection that I made two months ago. And then the rest of the year, we would be down 8% for the final six months of the year. So uh, really our projections certainly were uh, maybe too conservative. We didn't, couldn't, didn't know what exactly to, uh, to anticipate at that point in time. Um, but the other thing about it is that we were probably optimistic about how long we would be going through this because we really thought that we would just be hitting the second half of the year and dealing with a recession that would put us down 6%. So obviously we're already into the second half of the year and still feeling the impacts of, of COVID affecting our business sales. So my new projections at this point, um, in June projecting will be down 7.9%. And then following that the final six months of the year down 6%. Um, we did have uh, some businesses reopen in May. We've, we've, we will get the, full impact of some businesses being open in June that weren't open all of May. So that'll be a, that'll be a difference that we'll see. Dropped our second half estimate from eight to 6%, uh, basically just on, on, the, on the activity that we've seen over the past two months. Uh, if there's a resurgence of the virus, uh, there's no guarantee. 6% uh, would probably be uh, too optimistic at that point. Um, I want to jump in while he's moving through this. So when when you when you saw me show when I showed what was happening in the rest of the United States, and you talk about things like use tax and and you know that's really the money that a lot of these corporations invest. Um, if they start getting hit where they have other locations and and have financial challenges, um, I'm concerned. We're concerned that that takes that use tax piece and makes it a bigger issue for us. Is that a fair statement, Jim. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, equipment purchases and things that uh, haven't been taking place uh, during the COVID. 
Um, but we, we were projecting um, two months ago an $18 million shortfall across about a dozen funds. Uh, we're now reduced that to $11.33 million. If you uh, do have the information that I, that I sent to you this afternoon, you'll see that broken out by each of those funds. Um, the largest revenue shortfall is 5.88 million from reduced sales and use tax. Uh, that's five different funds that are impacted by that. And then also we have projections of a little over $4 million of revenue shortfalls in the general fund from a variety of revenue sources. Uh, a good deal of that from recreation revenues to 2.85 million of it, but also uh, a number of revenues. And, and I've expanded this to be more than just COVID impacts. It's uh, really, since we're dealing with our budget and making our projections at this point in time, we are including in our estimates now, any revenue source that we don't think is meeting budget, whether it's because of COVID or not. And we have had declines in some other revenue sources that, that probably aren't related to, to COVID, but we've worked those into these projections as well. So franchise revenues are impacted. Uh, we have investment revenues down, some development revenue down, fines and forfeits, um, utility disconnects, um, union reservoir fees, other licenses and fees as well. So uh, the, in the street fund, we are still projecting we'll lose about 475,000 from highway use tax. Lodges fund, we've kind of increased our projection that it'd be about a $350,000 shortfall for the year. Uh, then um, uh, what, what we've done in now in looking at these, these new projections, most of the funds are, are, have lower projections than they did uh, two months ago. Uh, obviously, all the, the sales and use tax, the five sales and use tax funds are impacted by these projections and, and are down at a lower amount. Uh, in the golf fund, we actually have uh, had a real res, uh, surge in, in golf revenue since we opened up the courses, and it's really made an impact on our projection there. We were, uh, had a $400,000 projection two months ago, but now we've got it down to about $130,000 shortfall. Um, and then we have a couple of, of, of small community services based funds with the museum, senior center, Cal. Um, so the, you know, that's one that is, we're gonna have to spend a lot of time on trying to really figure that one out. And the other one that I think is really gonna have to um, take a, a different look operationally um, is the Lodgers tax fund. Um, I, I think Jim, put this in, in his information where they've made a number of adjustments. But when we talk about how long the impact of some of these things are really going to um, hit some of these funds, the, the Lodgers tax fund to me is going to be one that's gonna have one, uh, have potential issues for a longer period of time, simply because we know that businesses generally have begun restricting not begun, they've been restricting business travel, which was a big component of our large lodgers tax. We really think based on what we're seeing, that's probably going to continue for some time until um, the numbers start evening themselves out or they get a some kind of a vaccine, which if you've heard the data recently, there's even questions about how long immunity lasts. Um, and so you take that, then you take travel generally um, and they're projecting that to be down. I think operationally, we're gonna have some issues. So I, I say this to council um, because this is one I think we're gonna have to dig in with, with the Visit Longmont group um, and really have some conversations about what this is going to look like um, over time. All right, great, thank you. Councilor Mark Christensen, did you have your hand up? Um. First, I wanted to thank you, Jim. I, uh, you said you worried that you'd made too conservative a projection, but as we, most of us learn from our 20s to 30s, it's always a better idea to assume you're gonna have a lot less money than to assume you're gonna have a lot more money. So <laughs> I, I, uh, it's better to know, you know, to, to assume that things will be worse and be pleasantly surprised that they're not quite as bad as we thought. Um, I do have a question about the COP payments for the four city buildings for um, Twin Peaks. 
are we going to be able to make those payments? Uh, Mayor Bagley, Council Person Christensen, uh, yes, in fact, uh, that I did, I do give you an update on that every month in that email, and it, it's a, it's about the only good news I have, right? So, uh, I can assure you that that that's uh, payment has no trouble being made. When you look at the sales tax activity, the village at the peaks, it's up. It's been up in each of these months. And the three anchors up there are obviously having significant sales activity because they all fall into the categories I've identified as, as being strong performers. So um, in addition, most of that's being paid by property tax anyhow. And, and I believe the assessment for that area went up for this year. So it's uh, in, in great shape. I, I will go back to your first statement though, because we, we are, it's a struggle right now. Harold and I and the staff are, are have to, to consider how to put together a budget without being too conservative because it's one thing to be conservative right now trying to get us through 2020. But when we got to give you a balanced budget, that means that we have to reduce expenses if we're going to be too conservative. And there are implications of that. And, and that's something that we're wrestling with now is we don't want to be too conservative. We prefer to be in a position where we can react to what happens versus um, having a significant impact on services. And then if I'm too conservative, I've impacted our budgets dramatically and the services that we have available to provide. So that, that's, a, that's a struggle right now. Yeah, I well, appreciate that because um, you don't want to prematurely cut things off. It makes for worse problems in the long run. And also it makes people, you know, it, it's, it doesn't help the spirit of, of positivity that we need to, all to have at this time. But I, I do appreciate what you're saying. And I, I'm, I know that you and Harold and all of the financial people must be having a, an extremely difficult time because once again, you're always predicting the future, but this is, a future that none of us can predict. So I know you're doing the best you can and I, I appreciate your monthly updates and thank you. To, to Jim's point, this is probably the hardest budget that I think I've ever had to deal with because there's nothing about this that any of us know. Um, it's not a typical recession. And, in, and to his point, I wanna be really clear, if we're too conservative, uh, then we're digging in and cutting. And then if we perform better, then it's how do you retract out of it? And what's the impact of those cuts? Um, if you're too aggressive, then you set yourself up for another problem that you have to deal with. So that's what we're, we're really gonna spend a lot of time on. And at the same point, anything that we get in better performance, and I really want to hit this one hard uh, for the, the community and our staff, the better we perform this year. And, and so it went from 18 to 11 and the more savings we have this year, that then helps us understand what the fund balances are gonna look like next year. Um, and, and allows us to take, you know, where we may push things a little bit if we know we have enough fund balance. But if you don't have enough fund balance, then you have to move into that conservative realm. Jim, again, is that? Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just you know, a reflection of what Harold just shared. Uh, I, I think uh, that would be um, code for wear your damn mask, wouldn't it? If, if we want to have a strong second half of the year, we need to do everything we can to keep our businesses as vibrant as possible. Yes? Your head, are you shaking your head? Yes. 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 I mean, so I just want to reiterate, I reinforce the, 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 the relationship between this discussion and what you talked about a few minutes ago in terms of infection rates and whether or not we're going to have kids back in school and on and on and on and what happens with our, our local business community or commerce. Uh, I, but I do have a, I do have a specific question uh, relative to, I, I appreciate Jim, the report, and I appreciate the detail both earlier in what you sent today. I just want to clarify, clarify in my mind that I'm understanding this. Uh, the, the one point, just under 1.5 billion in savings from 
uh, freezing of personnel. Uh, the only other place I see that is in the public safety fund. There's a $323,000 savings there. The combination is about 1.8 against the 11 million, uh, 11.3, right, that we're now projecting. Um, it, it, are there any, uh, is that, does that account for all of the hiring freeze, freezes? Because uh, I didn't, and, and the others, I know the others are generally projects and that we've got, we've, we've reflected personnel, savings from personnel in those two funds. Is that the way to interpret this? Well, it's, uh, Councilman Waters, it, it is correct that the, that is the two places where we have probably the most frozen positions identify. Um, all positions throughout the organization are being uh, reviewed uh, if they go vacant as to whether or not they can be filled or not. A director uh, will decide whether they even wanna bring it forward to ask uh, the city manager for approval. There's not as many in, in some of these other funds uh, probably that are being held back simply because like you said, most of them, uh, most of the other funds are project-based and have the, we have the flexibility to hold back on projects. It does not, uh, in these other sales tax funds, the street fund does have some, uh, certainly has some, some uh, positions in it, but it also has a lot of projects that they were able to have the flexibility to hold back on. Uh, we do have some other areas that, that uh, we are, are holding back on positions. They're just probably not as significant as compared to the, the amount of savings that are needed in, in those those two funds, because it is the most significant areas of pain for us really, are those two funds are, are going to, um, that have basically mostly salary and benefits from them. That's why most of, this, of the freezing has taken place in those two funds. So just to follow on Daniel Hill, um, I, we heard David, uh, David Bell last week uh, I think it was last week, uh, comment that we'd lost Jamie, our ranger up at Button Rock, uh, which I didn't know, which I, and I don't know Jamie well, but it seems to me that was a big loss based on what, you know, what interactions I had. And, uh, and I know that uh, in a subsequent conversation with David learned that we, that our senior ranger out at Union uh, had submitted his resignation or retirement uh, letter. Um, and the reasons for that, I think, you know, at some point it would be my, useful for people to know, you know, why we are losing seasoned, experienced, really good people, especially in areas in natural resources. Um, but is it safe to assume that, Jim, that th that would, David would come, you know, make the proposal that those are key positions to fill, given everything we talked about last week and what's happening in our parks and natural resources or our parks and green spaces? And, and the pressure under which our parks staff is working, um, that we that we would vacate those and then freeze those. Those Correct. would be vacated, but those would be those would likely positions that would be filled even as we're not filling others. Is that fair to assume? I think those two of those, if not three, are open. So after that is posted. Yeah, that, posted. Okay. Posted. Right. Posted. Right. I appreciate. I think that, to answer that question, and I think that's a great question. Um, we basically look at these in terms of the critical nature of this um, and really, um, you know, you start health, safety, welfare when you're evaluating these and then you look at the operational pressures on various departments yeah. um, to make that decision because we know we have to keep the savings. Example I will give you in, in how we do this, public safety, they had two open uh, 911 con specialist positions. They said, we'll, we'll freeze those. Since then, we've had a couple of, um, we've lost a couple. Well, we didn't freeze those um, because we need to really monitor minimum staffing. And those are some of the hardest positions to fill. So we went ahead and posted those so they could go through the process. And we went through that evaluation um, with Rob and Mike on, on all of those positions. and. When do they have to go into academy? When does the expense start? Um, so we can get as much savings as we can, but also manage that staffing level. And then look to 21 to go, what are we holding in case we have to have something that's vacant? Because the last thing you want to do is fill positions and then have to make a different decision yeah. in 21. Yeah. Uh, so just, well, I guess one more observation, then I'll shut up. 
um, in public safety I, as I look at the, the, the projected savings from freezing positions. Um, one could view that as, uh, as a COVID induced uh, defunding, right? I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're reallocating resources that would have gone to public safety. In addition to the positions in public safety, we, we chose not to fill with police officers, but we chose to fill with drug specialists and caseworkers, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. We have given up a number of positions, yep. to direct funds to uh, service areas other than criminal justice. Is that fair? Yeah, so when they went through on the budget last year, they repurposed some of those positions into that. And those are conversations that they're continuing to have. Yeah, so just as we go forward with budget or, you know, if we see positions being filled, understand uh, all those are scrutinized very carefully, position by position based on health, safety, et cetera. Yeah, yeah they, all, they all come to me. Thanks. All right. Okay, anything else, Harold? All right, let's move on then to first call flag trade. Let's move on to special reports and presentations. The water bond ballot, sorry, those are my dogs. The water bond ballot question, uh, the public information presentation. Uh, Mayor and uh, Mayor Bagley, members of the council, uh, Dale Rademacher, deputy city manager, I'm gonna open up this, this item for you tonight. Um, you know, the issue uh, before you tonight is really a presentation and to provide information to the city council uh, in, in alignment with and following the direction that you gave us back on March 3rd to take steps to prepare for a potential ballot issue on the November 2020 ballot uh, regarding the issuance of, of uh, debt in our water utility to fund critical infrastructure improvements uh, that are needed to, uh, again, to continue to uh, ensure our ability to um, reliably provide clean and safe uh, drinking water for the entire community. I think the other thing that we're all aware of, or acutely aware of, is uh, during the pandemic and the, and the downturn, both economically as well as uh, socially in, 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 in what we're able to do, you know, it's a difficult time. And, and we understand it's a difficult time for, for many in our community. Um, however, um, similar to uh, efforts that the, the country undertook even during the Great Depression, it, it's times like these where communities come together uh, to really focus on those key critical aspects of their infrastructure and to ensure uh, the future of them. So. Um, with that, uh, uh, Becky Skoll, who is our uh, communications and, and marketing manager uh, in, in public works and natural resources, I'm going to turn it over to Becky. Uh, she's going to take you through a very brief presentation and a, a short video that we have prepared um, in order to um, begin that effort of uh, sharing information uh, with the public. So Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Becky Skoll, as Dale mentioned, and uh, good evening to Mayor Bagley and members of the City Council. I'm here, as he said, to talk to you about public information plans to uh, inform the community about this potential ballot question this fall. And as he said, uh, you've uh, directed staff to prepare that resolution and uh, next month staff will be back with that for your review and your decision about placing that item on the ballot this fall. Meanwhile, in the public information arena, we've been busy uh, developing a plan to get the word out to the community about this potential ballot question and also to provide answers to them about questions that they might have regarding rates, the funding process and exactly what system improvements would be occurring. These would be improvements to deal with aging infrastructure. It would be maintenance requirements that we have to continue to have the uh, reliability and the quality of the water we're providing this uh, community. And finally, any kind of uh, capacity expansion that's needed to continue to serve the community. Now, Dale mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic and you're all well aware of how we 
we've had to change the way that we communicate with one another in the community. And uh, we're, we're also considering that as we're looking at our plan. And so part of the reason that we have this video that we're gonna share with you this evening is because we are finding that we will be doing a lot of the work we typically would do in person with large groups or groups of any size in the community through a virtual format. And we find that video is a really effective way to keep people uh, informed and to clearly and simply get the word out. And so uh, we have already sent an email to organizations within the community just to let them know about this possible ballot item and to make an offer to have staff uh, attend any meetings that they have virtually or to find other ways to share uh, factual information with them uh, now and in the months ahead. Um, likewise, of course, we're following the traditional communications uh, plans that we always use to inform the community. And these are uh, going to be done in both English and in Spanish. And these are anything from a news release to a social media post. It's also things we'll be reaching out through the city line and other targeted newsletters, uh, using social media, doing things through the cable access channels, neighborhood group outreach, and uh, you name it. We, we've uh, tried to make sure we've got everything possible to make sure this is being communicated as broadly and effectively as possible. If we've missed anything, we'd love to hear from you <laughs> to let us know what else we don't have on that list so that we just are as thorough as we can be. Uh, let's get back to the video that we have to share with you this evening. And it's kind of a soup to nuts video. Um, it's got uh, information about the source of our water. It's clean, safe, safe and reliable drinking water. So it explains where it comes from. Then it talks about how we collect, treat and distribute that water. We also include some information specifically about some of the needs that we have within the system to either renew or replacing uh, some of these aging, whether it's the infrastructure, the pipes, the buildings, the equipment, and also how we need to explain and expand our capacity, excuse me, to expand the capacity. Finally, it includes some information about this potential ballot question, and it includes some reasons that people might be in favor or not in favor of approving this ballot question. Now, when you see the video, I wanna make sure you know that we're working right now to get some closed captioning in place so that this video will be available both in English and in Spanish, and it will be ADA compliant. And we'll have that completed in the next day or two days. Uh, we're gonna share the video with you now. It runs about four and a half minutes. And when it's finished, Dale will come back and talk to you about ways that the city council members can be involved in this public information process. And we wanna ask how you'd like to participate. Um, I also wanna mention we've got some staff on hand. So if you have any questions after the video, technical funding communications, we're here to answer those questions. So I wanna thank you very much for your time this evening. And I'd like to ask Susan, will you please start the video? The City Council may submit a question to voters on the November ballot asking for approval to issue $80 million in water bonds to finance the renewal of aging water infrastructure and maintain system reliability and quality. These are critical citywide system improvements that benefit water customers today and into the future. A clean, safe, and reliable drinking water supply is always critical. It's of particular importance during times of emergency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Longmont's water is clean primarily because it comes from a very pristine source within Rocky Mountain National Park. That clean water is then stored in Ralph Price Reservoir, which is surrounded by the 3,500-acre Button Rock Preserve in the mountains west of Longmont to be ready for the community's use throughout the year. After the water leaves Ralph Price Reservoir, it is delivered to our two treatment facilities, Nelson Flanders Treatment Plant, which is the primary treatment plant for the city, as well as the Wade Gaddis Treatment Plant, which is really used in an emergency basis and for backups when necessary. The city's Wade Gaddis Water Treatment Plant was uh, placed in service in 1983. Uh, that plant now is reaching the end of its life cycle and the capacity that it currently provides will have to be replaced. 
The city recently conducted some engineering studies to determine what's the best way to replace that capacity. We had the choice of either replacing Wade Gaddis or expanding our Nelson Flanders water treatment plant. And the, the best option, at least cost for us, is to expand the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant, which was placed in service in about 2005. Fortunately, that plant was actually constructed with expansion in mind, so that makes it really an efficient option for us. In addition to expanding the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant, there are other planned upgrades in the potable water treatment system over the next couple of years. This includes potable water tanks that are aging now and have reached their life cycle, and miles of pipe that will also need to be replaced. In 2019, the City Council approved a five-year rate schedule that contemplated selling bonds to spread out the costs to upgrade Longmont's aging water infrastructure over several years. That rate schedule supports issuing up to $80 million in water bonds. Without voter approval to issue the water bonds, needed projects could be delayed and system reliability affected. Think of water bonds like taking out a mortgage on a house. Paying for improvements with water bonds helps acquire needed assets and infrastructure repairs now, while spreading out the cost of those improvements over time to avoid rate spikes. This keeps rates more predictable for users. Using water bonds to finance the infrastructure improvements also results in user rates that are initially lower than if cash were used to fund the improvements. This spreads out the cost of these upgrades more equitably across both current and future water customers. These are all considerations to keep in mind when voting. Here are some reasons why a voter might be in favor of this funding request. And here are some reasons why a voter might be against this funding request. A yes vote would allow the City of Longmont to issue $80 million in water bonds to be used along with existing fund balances and adopted rate increases toward renewing aging water infrastructure and maintaining system reliability and quality. A no vote would mean bonds would not be issued. Adopted rate increases would still take place. Those rate increases plus existing cash balances could be used toward renewal projects, but other funding sources would need to be found. The safety and reliability of Longmont's drinking water is essential to our community. We ask you to spend some time researching the issues. Ask questions if you have them. And most importantly, come out and vote. 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 Learn more about the water bond issue at longmontcolorado.gov slash water hyphen bonds. Election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Well, Council, I, I hope the uh, the video played a little better for you than it did for me out here in the in the uh, the, the sticks, as they say. Um, I really appreciate the staff that worked on that, and uh, I think they've done a great job. And I think it does tell a uh, both a factual and an accurate story of, of what's needed and why it's important. Um, you know, I do want to emphasize as well, and Council, many of you are are, are aware of this is. Uh, you know, the decisions to reach the point of uh, beginning the financing is really way down the line. Uh, this, 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 this whole effort starts with uh, master planning and engineering analysis years ago. And it takes many, many years to get us to the point where we're actually ready to, to now move forward with some of these critical infrastructure projects. As Becky said, uh, you know, staff were always interested in uh, uh, city council, how, how you would like to be involved uh, in the process. And again, this is all still predicated on your making a decision in August uh, as to whether or not to place this issue formally on the ballot. What staff will be working on is that ballot language along with the resolution uh, to effectuate that uh, placement on the ballot in November We'll be presenting that to you in August for your consideration at a, a regular meeting. Um, likewise, council has historically also passed a, a resolution of, of support 
on, on issues that they are bringing forward for the public to consider. And uh, likewise, if that is of council interest, staff would also get that resolution prepared for your consideration and action, uh, likely uh, early in September. The last thing I also need to mention is um, on the legal side of things, uh, both local and state fair campaign practice laws restrict the use of public funds to advocate for the passage of any particular uh, ballot issue or information coming forward. And there are exceptions to that law. Um, for example, um, work that we do ahead of the uh, ballot issue uh, being placed on the ballot is, is uh, we have greater leeway on what we can and can't do. Once the ballot issue is set, again, by action of the council, then we're quite restricted on what we can do. Uh, the video that you just saw had, has been reviewed by our legal staff. Uh, we all do find it to be factual and, and equally based with regards to the pro and con um, uh, comments in there. And importantly, city council, you as individual members, um, you do have greater latitude on what you can say and do. And so again, staff is interested in how we might be able to support um, uh, actions or, or efforts that, that you might be interested in undertaking. You know, this is the first time we've tried a, a valid issue in, in this type of a situation. And um, so we're all in a little bit of uncharted territory right now. But I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. If council has any questions, we will try to field those. Well, I guess my only question is, Dale, so do you need, and Harold, do you guys need us to do anything, take a motion, a vote, whatever, regarding um, uh, Give, do, do we need to direct you to go ahead and take necessary steps in order to promote this prior to going on the ballot and then in fact prepare it for the ballot? Is that and what you're doing? And members of the council, I think at this point this evening, uh, again, unless you otherwise directed, you, you gave us that direction back in March. We're continuing to follow that direction until and unless you change that course. And so, yes, the, the, the video that we prepared, we're ready to begin uh, with the uh, effort of, of sharing some of this information with the public. We wanted you to see it first before it is out in the public arena. And then importantly, um, uh, just to let you know that we are working to prepare the resolution and the ballot language, as well as a resolution of general support. Those are the two items again. So tonight, if you don't want us to do that, it'd be good to know, we'll, we'll, we'll stop doing it. Um, otherwise, we're sort of in auto mode, moving towards that uh, action that we will have in front of you in August. All right, so so rather than opening up for questions, et cetera, is there anyone here who does not want staff to proceed with the direction that we just heard? All right, so that said, is there anything else that's, okay, Councilmember Peck? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, Dale, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but both in the packet as well as on the video, uh, one of the main questions that are going to come up with uh, what is it going to cost the individual? So that is going to be the main question we're all going to get. And I want to make sure that in our marketing technique, what we as council people with all these hundreds of emails we're going to get, um, that we give the correct answer. So when you bring that back in August, can you explain the rate structure, how long it's gonna to take to pay off these bonds so that I find that people want hard, solid facts so they know what they're voting for. So thank you for that. And council member Peck will, will be sure to do that. And, and, and to answer it briefly tonight, the rates that you have already adopted for the next five years are sufficient to cover the debt service for the $80 million bond issuance. That's what I thought, uh, Dale. We all have very short memories. So I would like to be able to say that in a, in a very succinct manner. Thank you. All right, Councilor Christensen. No, I, I also, 
I just think people need to understand what you just said, Dale, that what, because the question we will get, no doubt, is, but you're already raising the water rates and now you want us to pay for more stuff. So please try to explain that in the video so people don't go, wait a minute, what are they trying to pull now? Um, because we're not trying to pull anything. We're just trying to repair stuff that has to be repaired. So, but people, you know, all of us need to be reminded exactly what was decided a year ago, things like that. Thanks. All right, is there anything else from council? All right, thank you, Harold. Thank you, Dale. Uh, good luck and keep pushing. All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Actually, let's take a three minute break while we go ahead and open up the first call public invited to be heard line.
Mayor, we're ready for you when you are ready. We have uh, several people who have called in today. All right, we all back. I believe we are missing Polly. I'm sorry, Councilwoman Christensen. All right, well, let's go ahead and start. There, there she is, I see her. All right, let's go ahead and start with uh, first call public invited to be heard. How many people are in the queue? I'll start with the first caller, Mayor. That caller, your phone number ends in 328. I'm gonna unmute you. Can you tell us, Don, how many are in the queue real quick? There were eight, Mayor. All right, perfect. Caller 328, do you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, if you could state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes. My name is Chris Boswig. I live at 1609 19th Avenue. Um, I just wanted to put in my two cents for the dismount zone that you're gonna vote on later tonight with the parking cut down for the non-restaurant businesses in the downtown area. I was hoping that you guys would not put the dismount um, ordinance in effect so that we could get more people that are not driving cars down to the downtown area and not have those non-restaurant businesses suffer further. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next caller, your phone number ends in 452. 452. Yes, I'm ready for that. We can get more people that are not driving cars down. Can you mute your live stream for us? Because we're hearing that in your call. I'm doing that. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Okay. All Perfect. right. Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council Member Sherry Malloy, 2113 Rangeview Lane. I'm calling in to speak to LDC updates concerning the protection of riparian habitat air, areas and habitat and species protection. A bit of historical context. On August 14, 2018, Council gave final approval to the first set of updates to the LDC in 17 years. A year later, on September 1, 2019, these new standards became effective. When the updates were approved in fall 2018, Council also direct, directed staff to include riparian protection amendments and to develop a sustainability evaluation tool to be used for assessing development applications. As a result, this section of the updates was not included in the 2019 standards. This made sense because the Wildlife Management Plan, WMP, was also due for an update and would better inform this section of the LDC. The public process for the Wildlife Plan began in March 2019 and was completed last fall 2019. Well, we're finally here. After comprehensive public participation, the consultants constructed a plan that has been thoroughly deliberated within city staff from, with city staff from planning, natural resources, and sustainability. Legal has also reviewed it. Is it perfect? No. Is it good? Yes. Is it better than the current WMP? Absolutely. Voltaire said, Perfect is the enemy of the good. The results of Longmont's 2018 customer satisfaction survey, survey found 74% of residents rated promoting natural areas from development is very important. Clearly, Longmont residents highly value protecting nature. This council has listened. All of you have stated your commitment to respect and protect our natural public amenities. And for that, many are sincerely grateful. Tonight, it's finally time to do just that and codify safeguards for habitats and species by moving this agenda item forward for first reading ASAP. Doing so will not only protect our precious natural environment, it will provide property owners, developers, and staff with clear and comprehensive guidelines. Finally, I know you're all aware of how tax the Natural Resources Department has been the last few years and how that's been multiplied significantly with COVID. Button Rock, McIntosh, both Cork Creek corridors, Sandstone, Union, and more have exploded in use and abuse. Therefore, it is extremely important to proceed with the plan of hiring an environmental planner. Also vital is fulfilling the 0.5 position for a volunteer coordinator who could help train and supervise citizen scientists, junior rangers, and other volunteers to help address 
the ever-growing needs. The impact COVID has had on the city's revenue is real, but so are the human impacts on our natural areas. Just as we wouldn't put a freeze on hiring for police for the vital safety protection they provide, this same mindset must also apply to our natural environment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next guest, your phone number ends in 637. I'm going to unmute you. Do you hear me? Yes. Great. Can you Go hear ahead. me? Yes, we can. Great. Good evening, City Council. I'm calling again about short-term rental regulations in the City of Longmont. I want to start by saying thank you for having it on the agenda and discussing it tonight. I hope that you can enact change that will protect homes and owners, their investments, and the quality of neighborhoods. Just this morning, the Airbnb behind us had guests that were playing loud music at 9 a.m. and cursing to the extent that we had to bring our children indoors. I hope discussions tonight can prevent this and other nuisances from happening in other neighborhoods in Longmont. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next guest is 882. Your phone number ends in 882. You've been unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Scott Conlon, uh, 1014 Fifth Avenue, and a Bicycle Longmont um, board member. Um, Mayor, City Council and staff, uh, tonight proposed uh, dismount zone ordinance goes before you for first reading as agenda item 8A. I wanted to highlight three components of the proposed ordinance um, there are concerns. First, it covers first half to Long's Peak. Um, back in May, when this uh, was open, um, it was really discussed between third and Long's Peak. Um, it, first to third doesn't have improved alleyways, and in some sections have no alleyways at all. Um, the sidewalk between first and second avenue on the west side of Maine is currently a bike and pedestrian detour used by the city. And then third, um, there are no controls to cross Kaufman at 2nd or 1st Avenue. Um, as well, the ordinance doesn't address avenue sidewalks. It's kind of interesting that that doesn't exist, but it seems reasonable that it should include the avenue sidewalks um, in the ordinance, but they're not addressed. Um, and uh, the ordinance, as written, proposes a fine of up to $300. In Fort Collins, the uh, dismount zone fine is only up to $75 after a written warning. And in Longmont, the second offense for resisting arrest is $150, $150. So we really don't think that this is equitable to say that biking in the dismount zone downtown should be twice as much um, as resisting arrest your second time around. Uh, in addition, those who currently violate the, the voluntary dismount zone are also those who are least likely to be able to pay for a fine. Addressing and educating those in this population is really key. So I'd really like to hear from the council how they're going to determine how LDDA is going about um, taking care of this with this population. Bicycle Longmont conducted its own survey in May, June, 2020, asking many of the same questions that were asked in the LDDA's 2012 dismount zone survey. Overwhelmingly, the respondents were mostly cyclists, were four and fourth dismount zone. However, they clearly wanted a downtown to be more bicycle friendly we wanted the city to address Main Street motor vehicle traffic concerns, the LDDA to encourage and not discourage cycling downtown, and to provide positive bike-friendly route signage and wayfinding, especially in the alleyways. If Main Street is for cars and trucks, sidewalks are for, for pedestrians, then where the cyclists um, are to go? Please provide clear and safe route for cyclists to take the alleyways for local travel to restaurants and businesses downtown. We ask that you restrict the alley, alleys to service vehicles and owners only and prohibit general motor vehicle traffic. While we applied the plans for Kaufman Street improvements, it is currently not a low st stress street now because of the diagonal parking and Kimbark Street is worse and has been referred, referenced several times by staff as not being bike friendly. I strongly encourage you to have staff meet and work with um, these and other issues with the bicycle community before we get this ordinance in place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next guest, your phone number ends in 949. Hello? Yes, you've been unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Mayor you, Bagley? Uh, before you begin, please state your name and address for the record. Thank my you. Name is, my name is Ruby Bowman, 1512 Left Hand Drive, Longmont. Mayor Bagley, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, and council members. I sent you my comments for the Riparian Code update, and I hope you had a chance to read them. I'll briefly restate them again. One, select the Fort, Fort Collins review criteria, one through eight, but amend item four to include key use areas for migrant songbirds and key nesting areas for grassland birds. Two, require the inclusion of the content criteria for the Species Habitat Conservation Plan in the Development Handbook and the Land Development Code. The criteria should remain in the code. Three, include the code revisions that are on page 13 of the red line draft version in the Land Development Code. They concern noise impacts, limitations on redevelopment, building height restrictions, window design to minimize bird strikes, and the use of native plant species. Four, for definitions under important plant and wildlife species, please include CPW's list of species of greatest conservation need, which is contained in the State Wildlife Action Plan. And finally, hire the planning department's environmental planner. Please fill this position as soon as possible. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Our next caller, your number ends in 820. You've been unmuted. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Great. Please state your name and address. Thank you. My name is Catherine Baylog, and I live at 1920 Spruce Avenue. I have been calling in about short-term rentals since we, uh, since we have one in our backyard. This house has caused us to feel like we have no privacy or security. Just this morning, my children and I were in the backyard and heard the F-bong being thrown around for about 15 minutes straight from the new guests that are staying there. Every week, it's someone new that we don't know, and they don't care about the neighbors that surround them. They're on vacation. Thank you for bringing up the short-term rentals into your conversation this week. Thanks for listening and helping us out. I hope you take into account property owners that have to deal with new guests in short-term rentals every week. And please try and um, adopt something like other cities around the country have, like New York, LA, Miami Beach, by banning short-term rentals under three or six months so we don't have people in our backyards that don't care about us that are new every single week, vacationing and partying. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Our next guest, your phone number ends in 323. Three. You've been unmuted. Uh, Jamie Simo, 525 East 16th Avenue. Thank you, Mayor and City Council for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm here to comment on item 11D on tonight's agenda, the amendments to the land development code. First off, thank you so much to city staff and consultants for getting us to this point. It's been a long haul, but we're in the final stretch. As we've come to realize even more strongly during this pandemic, our open spaces and natural areas are critical to public health, including mental health. And so we must protect them and the wildlife that calls them home. Therefore, I ask that council direct staff to prepare an ordinance amending the land development code. City staff has asked for direction from council on seven questions in the event that council asks staff to prepare an ordinance. I'm in agreement with city staff recommendations on these seven questions. While the revised land development code protections for riparian and streams, creeks, and wetlands, habitat and species are not perfect. Specifically, I would prefer if the additional riparian setback protections of height restrictions, bird-friendly windows, and native landscaping recommended in the wildlife management plan were incorporated into the code. Perfect is the enemy of good. These revised requirements are miles above the protections in the previous version of the code, and there's no better time than now to begin implementing them. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, our last guest, your phone number ends in 034. You've been unmuted, can you hear me? Hello, uh, guest? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, state okay. your name and for the record. My name is Timothy Ray Bairden, and I'm actually a property owner in Longmont. I'm not a resident. Um, I hope that's okay. Yes. Um, so I feel like even though I'm not uh, technically a resident, that doesn't mean that, you know, that I don't care about the city because I very much do. The better the city does, the better my business does. And so, you know, therefore I'm very much for, uh, for the city there and for downtown and, and the development and all that because I think that's good for everyone. Um, so I just had a couple of quick points. Uh, one of them, I might be slightly long-winded and I apologize in advance. Um, first, I'll preface, um, I've had, oh, and I didn't tell you my address, uh, 240 Main Street, Longmont. Um, that's actually uh, an apartment building right there on Main Street. So. I've had an Airbnb in Denver for three years, and I know Airbnb gets a really bad rap sometimes, but I, I'd like to differentiate, make a conscience, conscious differentiation between irresponsible property owners and responsible ones. Um, like I said, I've had an Airbnb for three years. I have very strict rules and I have zero tolerance for guests who don't respect my neighbors, and thus I get no complaints. One of the rules that and I also live in Denver, by the way. Um, one of the rules in Denver that I think is a really great rule is if you get complaints from your neighbors, then that tells you, A, uh, your Airbnb is bad for the neighborhood, and B, you're not a responsible property owner or, and or business owner, and people need to treat that as a business. Uh, so I would say that rather than a Band-Aid fix of restricting time periods, uh, three, six months, restricting people based on if they live in the city or own a business in the city, et cetera, et cetera. To me, that's a really good rule that kind of covers the spectrum because just because someone is restricted to three or six months doesn't mean that their guests are gonna be res respectful of the neighbors. I think in four, if, uh, a, an Airbnb or short-term rental, whatever the platform may be, if they enforce uh, good behavior, then I think they'll get good behavior. And if they don't enforce it, then they won't get it. And so therefore it could be potentially bad for the neighborhood and they need to lose their license. Um, one other thing that I had is uh, I noticed my building right in front uh, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, there are the loudest cars that race up and down that little one block strip. I assume they slow down as they get further up Main Street because there's like the pedestrian uh, crosswalks. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way to restrict the speed limits and enforce the speed limits right outside my building because I'm trying to uh, promote an enjoyable living space that's quiet and peaceful. And sometimes that's very difficult with the extreme, uh, like drag racing basically is what it sounds like, uh, well, whether I'm, that's actually true or not. It's Mayor Bagley. I'm going to, I'm going to, you're, you're past your three minutes. I'm going to have to cut you okay, off, but fine. I do appreciate you. I do appreciate you speaking. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you're you. always welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I believe that was our last, uh, last person. Correct. That is correct, Mayor. Great. And that will close uh, first call public invited to be heard. Let's move on with the consent agenda and introduction of reading by title of first ordinances. Mayor Bagley, item 8A is ordinance 2020-28, a bill for an ordinance amending title 10, chapter 10.20, creating a new section 065 of the Longmont Municipal Code, creating dismount zones, public hearing and second reading scheduled for July 28th, 2020. This item did have a revision published 24 hours prior to the meeting uh, because that title was wrong. 
Item 8B is resolution 2020-61, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont, the town of Bertha, the city of Broomfield, the city of Fort Lupton, the city of Fort Morgan, the town of Hudson, Little Thompson Water District, Central Weld County Water District, the city of Louisville, Morgan County Quality Water District, Platte River Power Authority, Superior Metropolitan Water District, Tri-State Generation and Transmission Association, and the Southern Water Supply Project Water Activity Enterprise, owned by Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District, for each party's consent to terms of conveyance for a certain right of way to the town of Erie and the city of Broomfield. 8C, Resolution 2020-62, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the United States of America for a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant. 8D is Resolution 2020-63, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County for a voter service and polling center use agreement for the 2020 election. 8E is resolution 2020-64, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and the Colorado Department of Transportation for state funding for the St. Vrain Greenway Trail Eastern Extension. And 8F is accept the city of Longmont's 2020-2021 water supply and drought management plan. All right, who wants to pull anything? Anything? Councilmember Peck? Thank you, I would like to pull 8A, dismount Jones. All right, anybody else? See, okay, Councilmember Idago uh, Faring? Yeah, um, I'd like to pull 8C and it's really just for comment. All right. Do you want to make a motion, Councilmember Lago Ferry? Sure. Um, I move the um, consent agenda uh, items um, eight A through, or I'm sorry, B, or what was it? B Maybe. through F minus the um, C. So no A, no C. I'll I'll second that. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the consent of agenda passes unanimously uh, without A and C. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to ordinances. There are no ordinances on second reading. So let's go ahead and start with the easy one first. Council member, they all Edago Faring. Do you wanna go ahead and make your comment and offer a motion? Sure, so um, I serve as the liaison, the council liaison for the um, Longmont Museum and over the time I got to see how this, um, the application progressed, um, you know, the, they're doing really good work. And I think now more than ever, we need to realize that or take to heart that our arts community, our, our museums, our performing arts, visual arts, they play a role in our understanding of history and historical context. So, um, it, you know, these are, um, I'm really excited that they've received this grant. Um, I don't know if someone from the museum is here to speak on um, on behalf of you know the work that they've done, or if they want if they want to. I think Kim was on. I'm not sure, um, but if she wanted to speak a little bit on on what the grant would be utilized for and some of those key things that I think need needs to be brought out to the public to put in the public eye. Is she here? <laughs> I am here. Hi. Hello. So the grant was actually a joint application. Hello, good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. This is Kim Manage, director of the Longmont Museum. Um, it was a joint application uh, with the library, which I think actually made it a really strong um, application. We were one of very few organizations in Colorado who got this NEH grant. Um, and so we're kind of the, the um, everybody is giving us accolades up and down the front range for receiving this. Um, basically what we applied for and received is um, to be able to uh, bring a lot of the programming that we normally do and translate it to an online um, context, which of course a lot of people are doing. And we've been doing um, for quite some time now since our doors have been closed. Um, the library actually is going to be purchasing hotspots um, that they're going to be able to check out for people who aren't able to get access to the internet. So that's going to be 
an accessibility issue that we're expected to be able to try to address. They also are offering some staff that will be able to do things like instruct people on how to do Zoom um, meetings and things like that, how to adapt in this climate. The museum is doing a lot of programming where we are taking um, our early childhood education online. We are taking our school tours online. And then we're also doing, um, we're expanding our downtown tours. So we've um, started an app. So it's a mobile website that you can access on your phone that you can take a tour downtown. And so um, the initial pilot project for that was a, a tour that Eric Mason does on a regular basis. And he actually did some in-person tours this um, past summer. And so we adapted that for an online program. And then we've also are gonna be developing additional tours for that application. So we really are trying to make what we already do well um, applicable to this online environment. And we're, we're very excited to be able to do that. And we're very excited to be able to get that funding because it, like I said, it was um, only 13% of applicants got that. So we're very, very pleased. All right, oh, great. So let's go. Let's go ahead. Uh, do you have a comment you'd like to make, Councilmember yes, Doug Ferry? I do actually, and and in the work that I've been, um, you know, just coming in and seeing their website. Something I am going to request of city staff is to allow um, our museum to have autonomy over their um, their website. So you know, I look on there, and and I, you know, my background was um, visual and performing arts. I majored in in that. And you know, it is for the artist realm to have that autonomy over the presentation of their work and their um, their accomplishments and their you know the museum as a whole. I would really um, encourage staff to um, consider allowing the museum to have um, autonomy over their website to really um, branch out and reach and know how to connect with the the public. That is all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member. All right. Would you like to make a motion, Susie? Um, yeah, I move um, item 8C. Right, I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. All right, the motion carries uh, unanimously. All right, Councilmember Peck, would you like to address uh, your questions, concerns, etc., regarding 8A? Yes, um, actually, I am going to call on Phil to once again let our cycling community and the residents know um, a couple of things about these drop, not drop zones, uh, cycling zones. So um, my question is, when you went out to get feedback, did you engage the cycling community on this, on the uh, cycling zones? Mayor Bangley and Councilmember Peck, uh, my name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. And to answer your question, we did, we have been talking to them. We have a bicycle issues committee that we have uh, that does outreach to the bicycling com community and, and we've uh, appreciated the comment. I think we've heard loud and clear that the bicycling, bicycling community really wants to see a more bicycle friendly and pedestrian friendly downtown. And uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we did work with the LDDA, the Longmont Downtown Development Authority, and Kimberly McKee, and uh, we worked on walking with members of the bicycling community, members of the um, disability, uh, members of the community with disabilities, uh, and members of the community that were um, very much wanting to see pedestrian improvements as well downtown. And and we all walked around with the consultant and did a lot of work to try to figure out how to make the downtown better. And I think you'll see that in the incredible amount of uh, dollars that we've invested in the alleyways that are just between Main Street and Kaufman, Main Street and Kimbark. Uh, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of uh, resources were spent on putting those together and making them uh, an alternative for bicycling and walking, quite frankly. It's a, it's a very safe for both. And um, uh, I think there's been other, there's been some other things where we've done some bicycle lanes as well, and uh, and, and uh, we've really tried to improve the walking access, and you'll see that in the lane closures as well that we've worked tirelessly uh, tirelessly on over the last couple uh, over, the, over the last month. Actually, it's been very fast and furious, but uh, we're doing what we can to try to improve that, and I think 
you'll see in the next, we are, we're actually, we just released a request for proposals today at 1.30 p.m. today for a consulting firm to begin design work on the Kaufman Street project, which is one block west of Main Street. And that's going to have dedicated separated bicycle ways as well um, as part of it and widened sidewalks. Great, great. And then one other question that I've had some emails on, I'm sure everybody else has as well, is that um, how did you come up with the fine of $300? And are there warnings before that? And if so, how many warnings? Mayor and Council Member Peck, I will probably have to defer to Eugene May on this uh, for some of those answers. but. It was something that was an up to limit as far as an up to $300 limit. And so um, our assumption is that there, you know, the, the fines would start small, but that, they're, that they were capped at that $300 limit. And I invite uh, Eugene to make any other comments on that if he, if he is able. Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney, uh, correct. It is fines up to. I do. I would want to uh, correct a comment that we heard in public invited be heard about um, the fine for resisting arrest. It is a minimum fine of a hundred dollars, and the up to the general penalty, which is uh, nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Uh, you know, I, I think there's no magic. I think that $300 makes sure that it's not uh, up to our maximum penalty of $999, yet it leaves discretion for the court to impose a fine commensurate with a violation. Um, you know, if we see repeat offenders, perhaps you get to the higher range of the $300. Um, but then again, you know, the up to $300 language gives the court discretion to um, see, impose a fine that he sees fit. A lesser fine if, it, if that is the case. Okay. Correct. Thank you very much. And with that, I am going to move to uh, what was it? I move 8A. 8A. Eight <laughs> I'll second that. Councilmember Christensen. Um, several things. Thank you for clarifying the, um, the fine because I was surprised. I, I didn't read it carefully enough to, and I thought that was a like the first time somebody messes up, they get a $300 fine. Um, and I do want to thank you, Phil, for, I, I was on one of those walking tours too with Aaron, and it gave me a whole lot of different perspective too on what somebody who's blind experiences. And I can tell you somebody who's deaf also cannot hear that there's somebody in back of them flying along at 30 miles an hour on the sidewalk. That's why it's called a sidewalk. That's why it's called pedestrian, meaning on foot. And so it's not just the bike community, it's also the walking community and the elderly community and the disabled community and the community with small children. And, you know, we all have to get along together. We can't, and now that we've got people eating out on the sidewalks, I don't understand how the bicycle people think they're gonna be flying along on the sidewalk in the middle of the tables. Um, we just can't have people riding their bicycles in a crowded space. And those sidewalks are crowded and we're using them now and the businesses need to use them. I, I would like to amend the, um, the uh, this motion, which is that we have now extended that up to Ninth Avenue and I know some businesses asked for that, but really there's very little going on between, and I don't, I'm not denigrating those businesses. I'm just saying it is not very busy from uh, sixth, past sixth up to ninth. Well, Paul, and, hold on, hold on one second. Let's just, Phil, Phil's gonna clarify what it is, what it says, just real quick, Phil. Yeah, I just wanna read the, it's really from First Avenue to Longs Peak Avenue is the extents of the dismount zone on the on the sidewalks only. Uh, okay, but it seems to me if we if we just cut it off after sixth, it would make the bicycle people a lot happier, and it would make it um, a little more logical because there just isn't there aren't that many businesses that are crowd that have a lot of foot traffic there that would warrant um, 
people not having the possibility of writing on the sidewalks. That's all I'm suggesting. All right, John, would you like to make a motion? I think we did. All right, well, uh, then I, did we, did we, did you make a move for motion? Did you move 8A? 8A, yes. All right, yes. I'll set, I, I remember who seconded it, but I'll second it. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of 8A, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, 8A passes unanimously. Let's move on to uh, 11, uh, general business item 11A, LGID resolution. I'd like to move that we recess as the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one. Second. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 The opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Let's go ahead with 11A2, resolution LGID 2020-04, a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one, approving the conveyance of property of the Boulder County Housing Authority for construction of a parking garage in association with an affordable housing project, eight, uh, 518, 518 Kaufman Street. Do we have a motion? I'll, I'll Cal move uh, approval of the resolution. Second Council move. All right. Uh, it was moved by Councilmember Waters, seconded by Councilmember Peck, and Councilmember Christensen is giving a hearty endorsement. Um, so let's go ahead. If, uh, if there's no further discussion, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, 11A2 or resolution LGID 2020-04 passes unanimously. I move that we adjourn as the Longmont General Improvement District Number One Board of Directors and reconvene as the Longmont City Council. So Second. moved. All right, I moved it. Councilor Christians has seconded it. Um, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Let's go on to 11B. Discussion on an upcoming bill for an ordinance amending Longmont Municipal Code on compensation for disposition of open space, space property. Um, I would hope that we have a presentation from staff and asking specific questions rather than just a general discussion. But David Bell, guide us, lead us, please. Mayor Bagley, um, Council Members, David Bell, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. Um, we have this coming up as a first reading and we know when Council sees disposition of open space, it can cause people to ask some questions about why we wanted to dispose of open space. So this really was just a quick opportunity to um, provide some context for this and maybe a couple of examples of why we want, might want to carry this forward and then ability to ask, ask some questions about that. So this really came out of the um, desire of the open space program to carve off a couple of house lots on the newbie property, sell those back and recoup those dollars for the open space program. When our attorneys look at the language in our existing um, ordinance, they didn't feel like we had that flexibility. So really what we're trying to do is the, the city attorney's office and the open space um, department are looking to come in alignment so that we have that flexibility. So there's opportunity to dispose of certain aspects of open space that really from the negotiation piece, we may not want to have to purchase, but the family, remember it was, that came as part of the package. So. Really what we're trying to do and achieve this language is do what we really thought we had the ability to do all the time, which is dispose of certain aspects of open space property um, through our ordinance. And this language just clarifies that we have that flexibility and makes it look clearer. So with that said, a couple of examples of that would be like the Newby property, where we have a property that we approach the family and say, this is a great property. We would love to, to own this property. We'd love to include it in our open space portfolio. However, we really don't want all the houses. Would you mind carving those off and pulling that out? So instead of paying 5 million, as an example, we pay only 4.5. The family could say, we really don't want to go through that. You just buy the farm or nothing. The ordinance language then allows us to buy the, the farm at that 5 million, carve off those lots, sell them at fair market value, return that profit back to the open space um, program so that we're not having to manage houses and we actually get to keep those dollars. So again, what we really like to see in, in the first scenario anyways. Another example is conservation easements. We may approach a family and say, we would really like to um, maintain this farm in perpetuity. We don't really need to purchase the whole farm. You're doing a great job farming it. We'd like to buy a conservation easement. Again, the family says, we really have no desire to continue farming. We just want the city to purchase the farm as a whole. So we, we purchased that farm for $5 million and we now own a farm that we have to rent out. And we have a neighboring farmer would like to buy the farming rights on that property 
And it, again, meets our objective of maintaining that farm in perpetuity. Um, having someone who is, does a good job farming farm it, keep it in the family, and the city owns those development rights, but the farm family owns those underlying fee rights so they can continue farming in perpetuity. So that's really what this is about. We just want to give you a chance to maybe ask some questions because when we start saying dispose of open space, um, people do get concerned. And this really is, again, I think coming in alignment with our um, legal team to make sure that the ordinance meets our, our needs to dispose of those certain aspects that really don't always meet the goals of the open space program and can provide additional revenue to the program. Councilmember Christensen. Um, yes, David, you're right. When I looked at this, I thought, ooh, selling open space. <laughs> um, but I do understand what you're talking about because a lot of times you have many outbuildings or farm equipment that the other, uh, a new um, farm farmer won't need that because they have their own equipment or whatever things that need to be um, gotten rid of. So this makes sense, but I just want to be sure that every one of these would also come before council, just as everything, whenever we abandon a right away, it comes before council. Whenever we eat, lease out space at the airport, it comes before council. It's public property. It needs to come before council. Is that correct? Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Christensen, it, it, nothing else changes in the whole process. It goes to PRAB first, it has public process there, it comes to Council for them to approve it. So it still is, goes through the whole disposition process, but this allows us to get dispose of a portion of at, at its fair market value rather than the, the whole property. So yes, to affirm it, it's exactly what you're, you're asking us. Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, David, um, I, I like the process of the PREB review and then coming to council. I, I do have a cure uh, in the paragraph or two below where that's detailed or enumerated. Um, in the in section whatever here, uh, under process four I or four A maybe, uh, it refers to in no event shall the sales price be or transfer be less than the original purchase price. In the in the example, like the newbie property, right? Uh, when you if it's five million dollars for the you know for the parcel, with whatever assets are on it, how do you determine what the what the fair market? Just through it, through, you could do a fair market price, which would be an appraisal. Um, but that would be less than the purchase price for the property, right? Mayor Bagley, um, Councilmember Waters, that's exactly what we're trying to, to kind of clarify here. So again, on the newbie property, we have a housing lot, which if we, as the open space program, we do not have a desire to own a house and rent a house, and we could, at the beginning, negotiate that off, we, we easily can get a, a comp on what a one acre lot with a single family home um, in that area comes with. So we can get a pretty good value for the housing lot and for the open space itself. So you're right, that price for that lot would not be the price of the whole property. So that's really we're allowing what this new language allows us to do. It really makes it pretty clear that we're trying to keep the open space program whole by allowing us to carve off that housing lot, sell it at that whole market value and return those dollars back to the open space program. So the, that original purchase price is then reduced by what the fair market value of that lot was after the purchase, as opposed to taking it off at the beginning of the purchase. Okay, I, but so that first sentence and second sentence look a little conflicted. Uh, I see the reference to fair market value, and then I see the reference to no sale price or transfer uh, less than the original purchase price. But um, that's it, not that's not conflicted. I, I there's two documents should be a, attached. There's the 2011 um, 10, and there's the new to the 2020 dash nothing, which is the new language. And that new one has struck out um, that, however, shall not pay less than that. Oh, okay, so I'm looking no at the wrong portion, resolution. No portion. And I think the new language, um, Dr. Waters is, um, for the fair market of the property or the interest conveyed. So then we can take that interest conveyed, which is the house lot or Got the- it. I was um, looking at the wrong resolution. The Thank conservation. You. So exactly what you saw is what the attorneys. Got so I, I appreciate you saying that because you really did just clarify what the attorney's office um, really saw as well. And I think people in this business for a while have, you know, 
interpreted the way we thought it was meant to be interpreted. And as we worked with our attorneys, they said, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So they, they've adjusted that language. I think if you look at the new language, it allows us to do exactly what you're saying. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I should have been reading the right one. All right, great. Thank you very much, David. We appreciate your update. All right. Thank you. All right, let's go on to a discussion on update on short-term rental regulations. Harold, is there a presentation? Yes, there is. Um, Joni, who's doing that one? Don, for chat. Don? Yes. Mayor Bagley, um, members of council, Don Burchett, planning manager. Um, I do have just a really brief uh, presentation. And I also want to make sure that I introduce some of the staff that are also on tonight so that if there are specific questions that I can't answer, hopefully we'll have the right people here to be able to do that. And I don't know if the presentation has started. Uh, here he comes. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, with me tonight, uh, we have Shannon Statler, the Code Enforcement Manager, as well as Dane Hermson, Senior Code Enforcement Officer, and Brian Schumacher, the Principal Planner for the City. Uh, we are here tonight to just provide a quick update on some of the STR uh, items that have been going on here in the city. Uh, then to also see if Council has any direction that they would like us to act upon. And so we are specifically here tonight to make sure that if council would like us to proceed with any code amendments or changes, that we get that information from council so that we can start working on that with our legal staff. Next slide. On the screen right now are some program highlights for the short-term rentals. The program began in January of 2019. We currently have 80 active permits in the city of Longmont. The map that's in the, on the right-hand side of the screen shows the boundaries of the city of Longmont, as well as the dots indicate the location of the short-term rentals that we currently have licensed in the city of Longmont. During the last 18 months, we have had nine code enforcement complaints that have come in related to those 80 permits. And then we have had 54 calls for service to our police department for 30 of those short-term rental property addresses. But I want to point out that while we got the call for service information from the police department, we cannot tell you that all of those calls for service were related to somebody using the property or that address as a short-term rental. We just asked for the calls for service related to the addresses that are licensed for short-term rental. And then finally, we wanted to note that in 2019, the lodger's tax generated was had generated for it just over $14,000 from the short-term rentals that were licensed in 2019. Next slide. As you've heard uh, tonight under public invited to be heard, as well as at past city council meetings, we've had a number of uh, people speak with some concerns related to the short-term rental pr program. Those have been uh, of two, two sides, I would say. One has been people who have felt that the regulations have not been strict enough. The other have been related to people who feel the regulations are overly burdensome. And so we've tried to identify kind of the common concerns that we have heard over the, over the last 18 months that the program has been in effect. For example, we have had issues where people have been operating without licensing and a permit. We've also had uh, people concerned about the residency requirements, both for and against uh, the, the residency requirements. We've also had people that have talked about that own property, similar to the gentleman that spoke earlier tonight in this city, but that are not a resident or an actual person uh, to be able to meet the requirements for being able to operate a short-term rental here in the city of Longmont. And then finally, we've had the neighborhood complaints about the you know, noises and uh, what we've termed party houses where we've had complaints with marijuana, loud music, things of that nature, um, and just really not being good neighbors. And so those have been some of the concerns that we've heard from both sides of people that are interested in short-term rentals. Next slide. In our communication 
uh, we did make a recommendation for a change uh, to the residency requirement based on some of the problems that we've had trying to enforce, to be able to enforce that. Um, and then finally, this is a policy decision for the city council. We will proceed with whatever direction the city council provides us tonight on what changes, if any, you would like us to bring back to you. We would just want to make sure that we get specific direction so that we can do that correctly and, and quickly to get that back to the council for consideration. Don, can I just ask quickly, just what is your specific recommendation pertaining to the residency requirement? Uh, certainly, Mayor, let me grab my communication. So it's on page 220 of the packet and staff made a recommendation um, to amend section 15.04030D 23A governing residency requirements for short-term rental operators. We would allow property owners who live outside the city or who have a home in the name of an LLC to obtain a permit to operate one short-term rental. We could also in the regulation could require property owners to list a local contact or a property manager that uh, would be a requirement for issuing the permit for that unit. That we, we think that would do two things. One, it would allow the people who own rental properties within the city, but for example, we have someone who lives up north of town in Boulder County, just outside, just north of 66 that owns a rental property on the south side of 66 and they have had short-term rentals in the past. This would allow them to be able to have that unit. The other concern that we've heard from some of the neighbors has been the inability to, to get property owners to handle those complaints by having maybe a property manager or a company that is listed, even for those people who don't live within the city limits, hopefully that would be a way to try to get someone to from the ownership to take responsibility and address the concerns that are coming from a, a, a house that maybe isn't being a good neighbor. Those were some ideas that we had. All right, thank you. And that is uh, all that we have for a presentation, Mayor. So okay. with that, again, we're here to answer questions and take direction. Councilor, Councilor Martin. Um, yes, Don. Um, I am wondering, and I probably should know that this about the existing ordinance, but I don't. Um, what are the what kind of teeth does this thing have? Um, you know, if if uh, a property owner is advertising uh, their short term rental as a party house, so that you're it's going to result in a a stream of of code enforcement complaints and uh, desperation on the part of the surrounding residents, which we've seen that we have in a couple of cases. Um, uh, are there any any teeth into this into the into the law, uh, the new law, where uh, it, you know if there are if the number of of violation reports gets to be too high, then that then that uh, house can lose its short term rental license. I mean, obviously we wouldn't want, um, you know, there'd have to be cause, right? When somebody responded to a complaint, there would have to actually be something going on as opposed to, um, you know, just so many calls happening. But are there any teeth that would, that would prevent a, a, a tenant who is, or a, a landlord that is not managing the property responsibly to lose their short-term rental license? Councilmember Martin, um, I'm going to ask Dane, who is on the phone, to uh, also speak to this. But there is a section in our code where we have the ability to renew a license every year. I think that we might want to look at that to make sure that there is an ability for us to not renew a license that comes up for renewal every year to make sure that we are legally sound in making that determination and protected as a city. But I would also ask if Dane's on the line still, if he could speak to kind of the, the violations or the, any of the, the teeth that are there in the current license or in the current code for enforcement. Dane, 
I, I think he just dropped off. Oh. Um, Excuse me, his hand is raised. He's raising his hand. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Councilwoman Mar uh, Martin. <laughs> can you hear us, Dane? I, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? There you are. Go ahead. Okay. Mayor Bagley, council members. So as of right now, there aren't any means we have to monitor party houses or, or how many violations someone would have. Um, all we can do is really advise people to call the police if people are violating those codes. That's certainly something we could try to look at. Um, but as council member Martin was pointing out, it really has to be based on the police actually finding a violation. It couldn't just be based on people calling in every little thing they, they hear that they don't like. Um, yeah. All right, Councilor Christians. We've been doing this now for 18 months. And uh, if you go on um, Verbo or Airbnb, there are at least 400 uh, Airbnbs listed for Longmont. And yet we only have 80 registered. And of those, we have no way to know whether they actually live here, whether this is their primary residence. Um, now we want to, um, in the, the recommendation is to increase this by allowing people who don't even live here and uh, LLCs to buy into Longmont and to continue to displace citizens who actually need to be able to buy housing or rent housing full time. Why are we favoring people who don't live here over people who live here? This doesn't make sense to me. This is a problem all over the country. I went to an NLC conference uh, that Councilman, Councilman uh, Rodriguez also came to with um, a, um, that had to do with Airbnbs. And all of us thought that this would help us cope with the problem of, of, um, of short-term rentals, but actually it was delivered by um, Experian, and uh, a company that works for them doing data to prove that this doesn't cause problems. And the mayor of Seattle, who's got had a huge problem with this, telling us how to cope with it. Well, the way to cope with it is not to let it keep continuing to grow. And um, I would suggest we need to double down on regulations because right now what we have is all over the country, there are uh, hedge fund managers and uh, commercial real estate companies buying up little properties in like Longmont. And locally, we also have realtors buying up properties. Um, I know there's one realtor on the east side of town who owns eight Airbnbs uh, in my neighborhood. So they're not even listed on this uh, map. Um, These people have the ability to completely displace or to largely displace um, properties that people could buy and live in and build some equity for their lives and do better than they're doing now. Or they could rent them, but now they're not going to be able to do that because people from outside who live in Boulder or Denver or Texas or wherever, want to be able to buy up houses here and turn them into um, one night to 30 night uh, hotels. And that, that I don't want my neighborhood commercialized. I don't want anybody's neighborhood commercialized in Longmont. I want us to be able to live in a neighborhood, not something that's rented out by the night. That's not a neighborhood anymore. And people all over this country are really angry about it and fed up. And it causes problems with the taxes. It causes problems with displacing children who could be living here and going to the schools. So I would not vote for us to be uh, allowing people from outside here to um, uh, buy up land in Boulder and rent it out. 
and commercialize our neighborhoods. I want us to double down on regulating them. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna call. I'm gonna start calling on people. I would just encourage people to maybe make a motion if we're gonna do it because we can all share our thoughts. But again, we're we're seven different people with seven different opinions, and unless there's some direction to staff that is coherent that four of us agree with, all we're doing is having a discussion. Okay, right, we'll go, we're gonna. I'll go. make that motion that we do not approve this uh, suggestion by staff to allow LLCs from outside to uh, purchase property in Longmont. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second no LLCs, okay. absolutely. I have I, some discussion though. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's deal with that motion first, okay? So is there anybody who would like to comment on that specific motion before we take a vote? Dr. Waters? Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, is this, you're going to limit this to LLC or any non-residential owner of a property? Because because uh, it seems to me that, that then we ought to we ought to be more explicit. LLCs or any non-owner uh, occupied to meet the criteria in the in the ordinance um, would be a, would not be permitted or something like that. So I'll be quiet if if somebody wants to amend that. But I but I think we ought to broaden it from just LLCs to anything that's non-owner occupied. All right, Council Member Martin. Yeah, I was really happy with the idea of limiting it to, well, LLCs and other corporations. And the reason is that I have a couple of, of constituents who are property owners in Longmont, sort of. Um, one uh, one family are snowbirds, and they have uh, a uh, a disabled resident that travels with them, and they want to be able to um, rent the property when they are out of the city, and that seems like uh, uh, you know that that they should not be able to do that is is a hardship on that family. Um, the other one is that uh, uh, some people who are Boulder residents bought a house in Longmont for their aging parents to live in. And the aging parents aren't all that aging and want to be the property managers and rent out a portion of the house while they live in it. But because their name is not on the title, they can't get a permit, even though um, they would be the ideal situation um, in terms of having a resident property manager, um, and it's a it's a, you know a nitpick of the title because it's it's uh, all people in the same family. So uh, I would um, I would be happy to exclude property speculators from this, but I'm not sure that I want to uh, exclude uh, familial situations that are just not quite conventional. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just personally, I, I just, just an observation and then I'm gonna be speak, speak specifically to uh, Council Member Martin's comment. I, I was an observer uh, when the council crafted this ordinance. And, um, and as I sat in the audience and, and watched and listened, I thought, I, thought that, I thought that many of you were on the council, not everybody, but you, you did a really good job, I thought, with threading the needle. Um, in trying to number one respect what what local homeowners might want to do with their property to generate some income um, and protect neighborhoods by limiting numbers and with the residency requirement that it that was only going to be an Airbnb or a short term rental if it was owner occupied at least six months of the year and the stipulations you laid into this ordinance that that limits what they can do when they're not in residence. Um, so in terms of sympathies here, uh, you know, I, I, I do have sympathies for first, you know, for, for residents who live in Longmont, number one. Number two, if somebody's going to be gone six months a year, I have no concerns about their renting their property. But there's a big difference between having a rental and an STR where people could be there. Those are just very different scenarios. So I have no qualms about somebody renting to their family or renting to somebody if they're going to be gone periods a year. But I do have concerns about non-property, non-residents using their homes 
or whatever the apartments uh, for short-term rentals. I just, I'm wondering in the, in the list of, of calls, we got a, a, a police report. How many of those calls were to, to rent to short-term rentals where there was an owner occupied, where it was owner occupied, which is the stipulation in the ordinance. Does it, can anybody answer that? Do we know? Jane? We do not know, but people are allowed to have investment properties in Longmont, so they don't have to be owner occupied. If you are a resident, you can have one investment property solely as- I have no owner. qualms about an, an investment property. Yeah. There's a big difference between leasing a house for a year and a short-term rental. And I am not sympathetic yeah. to an investor so, I mean, who's going to use a, something in the neighborhood you know, on a, on a, as a short-term rental. I guess I'm in the same place that Council Member Christensen is on yeah. that. I just think we ought to, if, if, there, if we're going to, if we're going to do something with this, we ought to be, if we're going to limit uh, non-owner occupied residents from being an LLC, uh, being a, <laughs> a short-term rental, it ought to be more than Joe's, those that are just owned by an LLC. It ought to be any property used that's not owner occupied or rented on a longer term basis. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, Councilwoman Christensen, if you will uh, take a friendly amendment to your motion. I, I would like to uh, incorporate what Council Member Waters said that they we will not rent to anyone who is not, who is an L, we will not rent to an LLC or someone who is not, not rent to, I'm sorry, we will not permit an STR to an LLC or owner occupant something that is not an owner, Longmont resident, owner occupied home. Does that make sense? Councilmember Christensen. You're still muted, Polly. I know, that's the space bar isn't working. Um, the ordinance already says that uh, exactly what Tim said, and I appreciate his support, and we, we're on this pa same page here. It already says that you cannot do that. The what we're we're not really having a discussion about STRs right now. What we're having a discussion is is about uh, staff's idea that we should open this up to LLCs, and in my opinion, that would make it worse. My uh, so I don't know that we need to uh, do that, but if, if that's your opinion that we need to clarify it that way, then we should say that uh, in addition to, well, I mean, right now we simply don't allow outside entities, whether they are LLCs or whether they are uh, non-residents of Longmont to own anything. That does not, as Councilman Waters said, that does not mean you can't have uh, property in Longmont and rent it out. You can, but you can't rent it out for 30 days or less. That's a short-term rental and we don't allow that. And so i not sure, I, I would happily include that as a friendly amendment, but I don't think it's necessary. I just don't want us to go forward with what has been suggested by the planning department, which is that we um, allow L, make the situation worse by adding LLCs and being, basically opening the door to people who are already behaving illegally, giving them uh, consent to behave illegally. Okay, I, I take back my amendment. So, so essentially the motion on the table right now, thank you, Council Member Christensen, is we're basically going to keep the status quo. We're not going to adopt staff's recommendations. We're going to keep the ordinance as it is. No, LL, well, no LLCs, and we're also not allowing anyone who lives outside of Longmont to start doing short-term rentals with properties they've purchased or owned. Dr. Waters? No, but, Sorry, Council Member Christensen? Okay. So... 
when I saw this, I thought we were going to have a discussion about short-term rentals and the problems that they're causing. Instead, what we've been presented with is a suggestion by staff that we increase the number of STRs by allowing anybody who wants to, to uh, buy a property at Longmont and turn it into a short-term rental. So that's the first issue that we're voting on. I do want to have a discussion of short-term rentals because as we can we will, see- and we, will do, we will do that. Okay. But right, right now, I'm just, I'm just okay. pointing out that we're not doing anything to change the ordinance. No. You're just right. saying- Let's not. Get it. Correct. All right. So Councilor Martin, before we no, vote, what no, I, was I thought I was- Oh, sorry, Dr. Waters. Yes, you were, sorry. sorry. You're just sorry, not as you're just, just you're just you're just you're just not as like pre predominant in my screen. Go ahead. You're up in the right hand corner. I can't okay. See. Well, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, so if we're gonna if we're gonna do something, uh, ultimately, if we're given direction to staff to, um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm not ready to make a motion on on that direction. But um, uh, I guess I need a better understanding of what of how it is. That a that a, a unit, uh, a home or an apartment, that where there is no owner occupancy, that's not complying with the ordinance now. Uh, and once we know that, why there is why that property owner continues to have a license or a permit, or maybe they don't, and they're doing it illegally. And if we know that, what's what's keeping us from enforcing the ordinance with whatever penalties go along? With somebody who who is inconsistent or not honoring what what we've stipulated in the in the ordinance as it exists right now, Joni, do you want to say something? Sure, Mayor Bagley, members of Council, Joni Marsh. So, I think a couple of things when it comes to our current code around short-term rentals and the enforcement issues that Council Member Waters brings up. So, we have found that if you look at the section about who can actually have a short-term rental, and we talk about the property owner's primary dwelling where the owner lives six months out of the year. I think that you have to recognize that folks may um, turn in a permit, sign and say they're complying with the rules, but for code enforcement or any staff to know whether or not someone is actually living in that home 180 days and renting it the 180 days is somewhat of a difficult situation from an enforcement standpoint. Um, uh, you'll probably recall we, we have, you know, five code enforcement folks and Dane is really our only housing inspector who does the majority of these inspections, along with some of our building folks. And I think what we've run into is, you know, as we do with many things when it comes to enforcement is folks um, tell us that they're meeting the rules. However, it takes an enormous amount of energy to figure out whether or not they really are meeting the rules. I think staff was simply making a suggestion about a change because we've had a number of people um, get very upset with uh, staff in permitting when they've said, hey, we have an LLC. And I think Marsh's example was one of those where those folks lived in town, they had an LLC. We've also had um, some instances where folks have had long-term, short-term rentals in the city live in Boulder County. And I think some of them have probably contacted members of council hoping to get this changed, um, which I don't think that we've provided them with any uh, avenue of support for that. But we certainly kind of struggle with folks who have either been in business or want to be in business. And what when they come in to get permitted, the answer is no. Um, and so I, I think we're what staff would really like to hear from council is in addition to some of the issues with the nuisances we found, particularly I know you've heard from the Arapahoe Avenue neighbors um, at every council meeting. What could we strengthen so that we could do some additional enforcement around party houses, which to Dane's point becomes very difficult because you actually have to um, have a, a written police report and take something to prosecution. So I think our 18 months of experience, I would say with short-term rentals is, is proven challenging, not just for residents and folks who wanna have them, but also for staff. We would welcome any suggestions on how to help us do a better job of keeping the character of the neighborhoods intact. And I think one thing that we're doing that hopefully will help us with this is we've hired host compliance who started in January, um, which wasn't great timing to go into people's homes this year. Um, they monitor weekly all of the short term rentals on the website to let us know who's not in compliance and our efforts 
once we get a little further out of um, the COVID cycle we're in right now would be to start doing enforcement and letting those folks know, hey, we see you've got a short-term rental. You might want to get that licensed and, and get your sales tax and start remitting that. So we kind of have a bunch of things. Staff is certainly open to any changes to this code at this point, but also keep in mind that um, for, for Dane to actually enforce some of this, um, it has to have the teeth and maybe that is where we're missing some pieces. Well, last my comment and I'll be quiet and yield to, to Marcia. If, if, if we're gonna err at this point, I'd rather err on the side of being more conservative, not more expansive or more permissive mm -hmm. uh, and make it easier for the, for the staff to enforce and, um, and take another 18 months to learn our way forward on, on doing less, not more damage to neighborhoods and, uh, and work with residents, Longmont residents who want to use their property in the way that the ordinance was intended. Mayor Bagley, do I have the floor? You do. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I will say I did have uh, either three or four families contact me in the last six months or the last six months before the pandemic began um, uh, all about uh, familial situations or inherited property uh, where they felt that they had this property and they needed to be able to take care of it. I don't remember there being an LLC involved in any of them, although it is perfectly possible that there was an LLC that wasn't disclosed to me, but was uh, disclosed to um the permitting department once we got down to cases. So I won't rule that out, but I was uh, advocating for some relaxations in the policy, not because I wanted corporations to be able to come and exploit Longmont uh, or change the character of neighborhoods because I absolutely don't. I was advocating for the ability to make an exception for what amounted to ownership by an extended family instead of by a nuclear family, um, you know, because we were in into elder care situations or um, super, you know, uh, uh, well, the one that the one that really kind of broke my heart was a family in Boulder who bought this house for their parents and the parents wanted to rent out the spare room and give them something to do and get a little extra income. And I didn't see anything wrong with that just because the name on the title was the children and not the parents. Um, and maybe that's too weird a case, you know, too exceptional a case um, for us to do anything about. And they're just gonna have to deal with going through probate and put the house in the parent's name and that would solve the whole problem, um, except their eventual problem. Um, but uh, that, was the o that was my only purpose in, in advocating for a little more flexibility in these rules. And I definitely agree that, um, you know, extending this to LLCs and maybe even other corporations is not, you know, is not the right response. Um, and uh, the other question that I wanted to ask, I think uh, Joni has already answered, which is, you know, if Polly can go online and find out who's advertising an Airbnb, then so can somebody else. And I think the answer we heard there was that the city has contracted with somebody who will do that, but they haven't gotten started good yet. Um, and I think they should have to do that. Um, and maybe we could even come up with some reporting requirements for when residents are out of town or in town. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want in general to, to broaden this. Maybe there should be some process to uh, apply for an exceptional permit. That would take care of my couple of my family situations too. All right, Council Member Peck. First of all, Mayor Bagley, we have a motion on the floor. I would we like do. to call that question. Um, and I think that it would be a good idea to just um, 
not go with the recommendation of LLCs and let's try it and see how that works and come back and revisit it. So I would like to call the question on that motion. So if you're going to call the question, it requires a second, then we have to have a vote that passes with a super majority. Does anybody, can we just, but can we just vote on it? Councilmember Christensen. Sorry. Um, I'm wondering if we even need to vote on it. If we just don't follow the recommendation, do we need to vote on it? There's a motion on the table. So let's go ahead I and vote on it. I could withdraw it since I put it on the table. You could. Okay. That, that would mean that we just would not broaden this law. Correct. If, you, if, there's, no, okay. if there's no motion to okay. adopt then I would, the Okay. Then I withdraw this because that will simplify things. All right. But so, I would like to have a discussion on what we can do about the problems that we already have. Okay. We can, we can do that. So I guess my, my, my point is that, yeah. So again, let's hear from staff. On, so here's, what, here's my frustration. I've talked to a couple of council members about this. Staff, I, I would like you to tell us what you think we should do and give us a map ahead that would allow us to say we like it or we don't like it. But having seven people at 10 o'clock at night start giving you random ideas on what we should do, mm -hmm. I think is a, a no, I'm, okay, 9.43 p.m. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that I, I don't have a problem having a discussion. What I want to do is have some guidance because what we do, it's a pattern. I've been doing this nine years now and what happens is that they, they give us an idea and then we spend an hour talking about our different ideas and we all get frustrated because there's no cohesive direction, at which point we look at staff and we say, hey, what do you guys think? So I'd let, I'd rather, I wanna just jump to the end and say, staff, what do you think we should do? And then we'll give input. So Joni, what do you think we should do? Mayor Bagley, members of council. So I know this item was of a concern to several council members who asked that I bring this forward so that you could all have a discussion about where you'd like to head with this. One thing I would note in your council communication is that staff, particularly code enforcement staff who are doing the permitting and the inspections and the enforcement have really had a limited number of code violations called into us. We've only had, I think, eight that was, were listed in here. And as Don mentioned earlier, the calls for service from the police, we don't really know specifically how, if we could try to figure that out. I don't know that we have enough um, information to do that, whether they're directly related to the homeowner, the home, you know, something happening in the neighborhood. When I look at that list, there's a lot of things that seem fairly subjective, like they aren't specifically tied to a short-term rental or a home. So I think that we could continue to use the rules that we currently have in place, do the additional, additional enforcement that we're contracting with to try to do, and um, you know, continue to enforce where we've told people you can't have a short-term rental if you don't live in the city and if you don't, have, um, you don't meet the requirements as currently laid out. I think that some of the issues, um, particularly on the Arapahoe Avenue home, um, was a short-term rental for a year and we got, I don't think we got any complaints with the previous owner who was also had a short-term rental. The new owner purchased that and that's really when those complaints started. So I think as with many things in our community, we get a few homeowners or bad actors who cause a lot of um, neighborhood issues. So perhaps there's an avenue for us to go back to the city attorney's office and talk about how we might do some better nuisance enforcement or how we could change the code so that um, I or, or someone uh, could um, take the permit away basically based on a number of commit, um, permits. You know, um, typically we have to have cause for that. So it's not as simple as um, someone calling me and telling me that's happened. I think we'd actually need to substantiate that, but we could certainly look at that as an avenue as well. Right now, I don't think staff has any specific recommendations because again, we haven't seen that many code complaints and we have only had a few folks who haven't been able to do what they want and, and that's the nature of the permit and the rules we've issued. Councilmember Christensen, then we'll go with Councilmember Peck. Um, okay, so I think that what you're saying is, as uh, Councilman Water said, we need to put some teeth in it. So um, when you ha have a, 
we also need more than one code enforcement guy. <laughs> you must be so tired. Um, so when you hand out information to them, hand out information that gives them the law and that gives a list of fines if they do not comply. And you know, if we can, if we can um, fine somebody for not dismounting up to three hundred dollars, we can certainly um, fine people for not complying with uh, having a license, having it be their primary residence. If we need to make a, a list of uh, fines associated with violations, then that's what we need to do. And the code enforcement um, officer needs to give them those list of fines and tell them they need to comply. Don't be nice to them. Don't say, you know, you really need to have a license. <laughs> Just tell them, you need to have a license. You're way too nice, Joni. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so I would suggest that we have some fines and that we have some code, some way that we can. Also, if we have 80, um, uh, STRs listed, how about if we give that list to the police? And anytime the police get a complaint uh, that is on that list, they inform you. So that way we can keep track of it. Because as you're right, there's no way of knowing whether what the police, uh, I mean, there's no connection between the police and, and your department, so, um, or in planning department. So how about if we give the police list and if we develop some, uh, as Councilman Waters said, teeth in this so that people will not take, you know, so that they will understand that they do have a community obligation to be licensed, to be inspected, to meet certain criteria for a safe community and also to preserve our neighborhoods. So Mayor Bagley, if I may. Right. Yep, you may. Um, so I'm having a chat going with my code enforcement staff who are also on the on the call tonight. But you know, currently we can do admin fees or fines like we do for other code cases. And we do interact with PD daily. Actually, in code enforcement, they are one of our best allies um, because we do not um, have the same enforcement capabilities and they certainly are our partners. So perhaps we will what we should do is go back and speak to the city attorney's office and the prosecutor's office about the admin fine section in the code and how maybe we could start using that. Obviously, we're still gonna need proof. And so we would still need a ticket or a police call with a citation or at least the documentation that it happened to kind of make a record, if you will, to issue some of those fines. Um, that's certainly, I won't lie, that's certainly some work on everybody's part um, but perhaps we can have some conversations about how we might be able to do that. And we could come back and let you know what we think is feasible with regard to that. Council member, uh, I think Peck had it. Let's go Peck Martin Waters. Okay, thank you. I am actually gonna make some motions because I wanna see parts of this ordinance changed. Um, it says uh, in the ordinance that um, rental of a second or invis investment dwelling unit as a short-term rental is limited to one per Longmont resident. So I would like to move, make a motion. I move that a, rented, uh, a rental of a second or investment dwelling unit may not be used as a short-term rental. It can only be used as a long-term rental to one, uh, limited to one per Longmont resident. So just to be clear, is the motion to get rid of short-term rentals altogether in Longmont? No, no. The short-term rental is your primary residence. You can rent it when you are not living there, according to the ordinance, but you have to live there six months out of the year. Do we allow short-term rentals other than that, Harold? Yes, we do. It says right in the ordinance. Rental. Yes. Of, yeah. Okay, so what you would do is take away a second Right, non-residential location. Short -term rental, they can have, but it's a long. They can have investment property as long-term rental, but mm -hmm. I want to remove it. The second or investment dwelling as a short-term rental. I want to remove that. All right. So, do I, that. Sorry, say that again, Dr. Waters. 
I said I'll second that motion. Okay. Customer, uh, all right. So do we have anybody for the or against the motion currently? All right, Customer Christensen. Yes, I think this would um, eliminate many of the, the issues that uh, Councilman Waters was talking about and a lot of the the secondary kind of problems that we have. If And, and it would still allow uh, if, for instance, uh, Councilwoman Martin's um, elderly couple, you know, if you're buying it for your parents, buy it for your parents and sign it over to them, then this wouldn't be a problem. But then they could still rent it out. To, they could still rent out things. They just have to, you know, live there. But anyway, so I'm, I second it. I guess I, I'm pretty sure I'm in the in the, the, the lone lone voice on the other side on this one. Um, I just think that uh, so as I've heard some of the conversation, and I I think that uh, an LLC, uh, whether it's a corporation or an LLC or or, or a partnership or what, whatever it is, it's just a legal format for one or more people to essentially just put a property into a a uh, something that will protect it in the event that you're face you face financial calamity. So um, all my properties are owned by LLCs, but I'm the sole owner of the LLC. And so um, uh, by uh, that's number one or two, um, I, I don't have a problem with people. If they, if they own a home, there are plenty of people that that uh, aren't rich that might have chosen this to to what uh, this might be their way of retiring. If they were a school teacher or if they were a firefighter or um, not all, just because you own property does not mean that you're rich or you're a developer or you're these, I mean, we're, we're making decisions tonight, I think without without having data. You know, we, we've heard um, people, we've heard a, one group of, of one neighborhoods coming in and they obviously do not like the owner of their short-term rental. Um, uh, we've heard that again and again and again, but I've had pro I've had neighbors that say the f bomb all the time. I've had neighbors that throw their cigarette butts in my yard. I currently have great neighbors. I don't have time to pick up dog poop or watch my dogs. They bark too much, and the dogs eat all the trees. I mean, my neighbors could say, "Oh my gosh, we don't want politicians living next door because single men who who uh, have children and dogs just shouldn't be living in Longmont." I mean, it, it, the the point is, I just think that if People own property. Uh, in general, we have laws that basically say you cannot disturb the peace. And if they break the law, call the cops. But I think that by micromanaging property owners, I think that's that's just bad public policy. So I'll be voting against this. But Councilmember Martin. Well, first of all, Mayor Bagley, I'm going to tell all my friends in Prospect that you don't pick up your dog poop, um, and they're going to get you. Um, <laughs> Because as a homeowner, everyone should pick up their damn dog poop. I mean, if they're in my backyard, I pick up my dog poop outside. I'm talking about in my backyard. I only have, I pick it up once a week. And I'm just... yeah, okay. Well, that's still pretty nasty, but okay. Um, uh, I I actually agree that LLC isn't a magic word, um, and that if a person lives in Longmont and owns a house in Longmont, it doesn't matter whether they put it in an L, they have it owned by an LLC or own that directly, but they should have to live in Longmont and let the staff take care of that. Um, you know, it's the fact is that the owner of record has to live in Longmont. Point of order, point of order. Yes. We're not talking about the motion at all. Can uh, we talk about this motion? You're talking about um, LLCs now, and I thought we already decided that we're not going to change. The, mo the motion currently on the now table. I, the, the, motion, the mayor did bring the LLC thing no, back. Hold on, hold on, time, yes, the, the, the motion currently on the table is to make it so that um, you cannot rent um, uh, investment property as far as short-term rentals go. <laughs> Meaning you, know, you, if you're, you, you have to own it, you have to be an owner-occupier, then we'll allow short-term rentals. Other than that, nobody else would be allowed to have a short-term rental. You have to, the ordinance contradicts itself in that we've already said that your short-term rental has to be owner-occupied for six months. If you own another investment property, it, mm -hmm. it can be an investment property, but I, 
I wanted the motion is to not make it a short term rental. Right, and I am against that. It can, fine, can we vote on that then? Because it's no, we, not we, about LLCs. Right. Well, well, right now I, I get that, but Councilmember Martin is sharing her opinion on this, and we'll we'll go ahead and, and hear what she has to say, and we'll vote after everybody's had a chance to talk. Trust me, I want to vote right now, but we're not going <laughs> to. Councilmember Martin. Here. So we really have three cases. We have somebody who who leaves town and rents the whole house. Um, either short term or long term while they're gone. Um, we have the case where somebody lives in the house and has a spare room or a spare suite or a, an auxiliary dwelling unit. And they can rent that as short term or long term. Um, and then we have the whole extra house that's just an investment property. Um, and that I think is what council member Peck wants to eliminate. If you say whole house investment properties that you never live in can't be short-term rentals. So that's, um, that's what she's saying. Can we confirm that? Nod your head, council member Peck. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, because I think there's some confusion about what the cases have been. Okay, uh, now as it happens, um, I think you should be able to have a short-term rental if you have one property and you live here and manage it. I think what we need is enforcement. I think that, you know, and it's a separate motion, so I should talk about it later, but, um, but I just, I don't think that the ownership arrangements are the problem. I think that it is the management by the owner that is the problem. If nobody cares, let's go ahead and vote on this. Okay, I like Councilmember Peck's suggestion. All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of the motion, which basically says that we will not allow short-term rentals uh, for for secondary investment property. Um, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. 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 All right, the motion carries five to two with uh, Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin uh, dissenting. All right, great. That might solve a lot of our problems, to tell you the truth. All right, Dr. Waters. So, um, Joni, what you made reference to um, uh, having to show cause to to rescind or or to cancel. I, I don't know what the right terminology is. Uh, a license or a permit? Is it a license or a permit? It is technically a license. That a business we're license. Yeah. It's, so. Yeah. What, what would be the, give me some, ex, an example or some examples of um, what, what for you would be cause and what is it in the, in the ordinance that's lacking that would allow in short order uh, uh, Dane or the planning department to withdraw or cancel a license because someone is not, uh, uh, some, it, a property is not owner occupied. Or they're not following the rules. What, what do we? What, what what do you need that's not in the ordinance when it gets to that point? So when I look at the current ordinance, and if you look at you know the the section three, which is really the conditions of approval, and it's it kind of lists out that you're complying, and to some extent, you know everyone is. Um, by affidavit basically saying, yes, I comply with these and I agree, I only live here six months out of the year. We're, we're relying on people to be truthful, frankly, about what their endeavors are. Um, but when I look at the conditions of approval, the conditions of approval allow some control of nuisance, occupancy limits, which are related to the building code, parking restrictions, and we can make those the list on there. I think that perhaps what we're missing is the permit duration is one year. So when it comes up for renewal, we could certainly say, take a look and, and say, hey, we're not gonna renew your permit for next year because we've received X number of complaints. But I don't think, to be honest, that the ordinance as currently written gives a good legal standing to make that finding. For me to either revoke a permit in particular, I think requires the proof I talked about earlier um, and some way to basically find someone and revoke that. Um, and I, I think that we need to sit down with uh, 
Deputy City Attorney Tate and talk a little bit about that in the next week. But I think we're just missing some specific requirements that would give specific permission to revoke. So in, in the spirit of what the mayor was suggesting in terms of what you would bring back to us, I would request that you bring back that specific uh, criteria for uh, that would establish that whatever cause you need to make uh, to, to cancel or, or withdraw a license. Let me just ask one more question, then I'll mute. Um, if I if I'm going to go to the uh, recycle um, facility to dump, you know, grass clippings, which I don't do anymore, I compost, but big branches, right, uh, or something like that, um, I have to show a, my utility bill. I mean, how difficult it is it if somebody's if there is a complaint to say we need evidence. It's on the homeowner's part provide the evidence that they were living in the home for six months. Why would we have to chase that or, or sleuth around that question? It's on, it's on them to affirmatively demonstrate that they're complying with the ordinance. Don't, don't we have yep. means, whether it's a, 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 a utility bill or some other basis for establishing it? Council Member Waters, um, we can certainly ask for, for paperwork and people can provide that, but it's very easy for them to just change their address under the utility account to say they live there, but to not actually be there. The fact is we can't account for where they are 180 days out of the year. That's where we're running into trouble because people will absolutely lie and they will change their paperwork to get around these laws. Well, if we had a lie detector test in your office, would that be? <laughs> so, so I think uh, yeah, obviously I'm not being uh, facetious, but uh, yeah. then, so it's not that, what is it? Because it seems to me that we ought not to be chasing it. That somebody wants a license, it's on them to convince us that they're that they're legit. It seems to me. Well, Councilmember Waters, I, I agree, and I think that we probably won't have Jim be able to fund us a lie detector machine, albeit that might be interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that certainly the other thing that, that Shannon, Dane, and I can do is, is check in with some of our other counterparts around the Front Range and, and in the mountain communities who have more extensive short-term rental experience than we do and maybe see what some of their regulations look like and how they are doing some self-certifications from owners and how they can then take that and if they need to elevate that to revocation or to um, a fine. So Mayor Bagley, we don't need to turn that into a motion, or do we? I don't think so. I think what I also I think what I also hear is really tighten up the restrictions in terms of um, well, we have limits in terms of people and parking and those types of issues, but making that a little more robust so Joni can use that in terms of so we can actually deal with the situation versus it being I'm, obscure. I'm actually going to make a motion, and I move that we direct staff to come up with a list of suggestions to fix the ordinance that would resolve a lot of the concerns that we're hearing from our constituents. I think that's what we should do and have staff come back and then we can, we can have a discussion if it's needed, but they're the experts. They deal with this stuff. They hear it all the time. And I think uh, if something needs to be fixed, we should ask those guys to come back and tell us what needs to be fixed. I will second that mayor, but I want to say that I think that the six months occupancy is a complete red herring um, and that instead we should be looking, we should be directing as part of your general direction to make the list, we should be looking at the list of police policies. If there is a complete list, which you're in the process of putting together of what is a short-term rental, then the police could have a checklist of if there is a nuisance call, then they find out what's going on and they, and they, they tag that issue or citation or whatever it is with the information that this goes into the short-term rental history of the property. Because then we have what we need to give this ordinance teeth. Councilor Christensen. Um, how about using the term primary residence? That means that is where you vote, you're where you're registered to vote. That means that is where you pay your property taxes. 
those things are findable by our staff. That's Wouldn't exactly that make right. it? That's exactly, and that's what Marsh is talking about too. Instead of sick, make it a little, make it a legal term, make it something that's legally findable by us. And um, I think that's what uh, Councilman Water, well, what all of us are looking for is something that enables, something you can find without relying upon their good nature. I lived in San Francisco and believe me, the rent ordinance was uh, a joke because there were a million ways around it. And that's exa that's what always happens. So if we use the term, yeah, I, when you talk to Teresa, ask her what would enable us to find, to put teeth in it and also that is findable by our staff without, uh, onerous uh, efforts. Thank you. That is, that is exactly why I made the motion. Harold, do you feel comfortable? We're about ready to vote. Do you feel comfortable bringing back something to us? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Thanks guys. Councilmember Peck. Since we are giving, since Joni's gonna uh, get, bring back a list, I would like you to look at time limits on short term limits short-term rentals, for example, a uh, minimum of a 30-day rental so that we don't end up with hotels in, in residence. You have to rent it for a minimum of 30 days. Councilmember Christensen? Um, a short-term rental is a maximum of 30 days. Is that what you mean? You can't, it's not a short-term rental if you're renting for more than 30 days. Yeah? I guess my- okay. My, my, my only conclusion here is that my only concluding comment, I don't care if I'm the mayor, mayor pro tem or city council member without four of us voting, um, it's not policy. So the motion was to have staff bring back um, their suggestions on how to make this ordinance better. So, all right, now let's move on to 11D land development code updates, section 15.05.020 and the 030 concerning the protection of streams, creeks, wetlands and riparian areas. Hi, Mayor Bagley, uh, Don Burchett again, planning manager. We do not have any uh, special presentation or PowerPoint. Um, as the council has heard uh, previously, we've been working on a number of items for council related to the SES, to the wildlife management plan update and the land development code that started changes that we made back in 2018 as a result of the wildlife management plan update. And then in going through these sections of code, staff has proposed changes to the ordinance. We've included a red line version of our proposed code changes. Uh, that, was a pen, that was attachment one, a clean version, which had all of the red line strike throughs, everything removed so that you could read it to see what it would look like if it was adopted as it's proposed by staff. And then the third attachment was the Appendix A from the Wildlife Management Plan, just so that you could see some of the changes that we made compared to what was in that document that you had recommended uh, be approved by, or that you approved for, for the Wildlife Management Plan. So in our council communication on page 232 is where it starts, we had seven questions and recommendations that we were hoping to get uh, direction from council on. And I don't know the best way if you want to go through those one at a time, I'm happy to offer a brief explanation of what they were meant to do. Or if you just want to see if someone would want to make a motion related to each one. And if there's questions, I can answer those at that time. But I think due to the, the, the time of night that we're at, I don't think you really want me to spend a lot of time trying to explain everything. Is there any, so what do you, I guess the real question, I'm gonna call on you Dr. Waters in just a second. I guess the real question is, what does staff need to do to move forward with this particular land development code update? Because one, we would I, th I, I, I mean, I'm just, I get the impression that in general, council is happy with it. Okay. It's not, as we heard from Sherry Malloy, it's, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good, right? So what, what do you 
What do you want from us? One, I would like a motion for us to go ahead and create an ordinance to bring it back to you for first reading. So uh, moved. And then. So moved. Uh, second. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. I would have seconded it for you, but I, oh, well, I appreciate I appreciate that. Okay, what else do you need? Uh, did you want to vote on that? Well, we could, but Dr. Waters has something to say, and then we'll go from there. And then Councilor Christensen and Councilor Peck. They all, and Councilor, I think we all have some. They, oh, I see lots of hands. We'll start with Dr. Waters. Well, my question was going to be, uh, given the staff recommendation, there are three options in the staff. Number two was direct the staff to prepare an ordinance, which is what you moved and was seconded. My, I was then going to ask Don, um, do we need to answer these questions individually, or would the motion include a, the acceptance of staff recommendations because there's an affirmative recommendation in each of those seven areas uh, to, uh, to attach or to include in the motion. If that, and if that's the case, I, I think we will have accomplished almost everything that the staff wanted to accomplish with this item. Is that if true? You, if, you would, um, if you would make it a, a friendly amendment to the motion to take staff's recommendations for those seven items, we would proceed in that manner with the ordinances as we've explained them in the council com. Yes, you're correct. Would you accept that amendment? Oh, absolutely. Then I move that amendment. All right, uh, council member. So based on the motion on the table to direct staff to bring back an ordinance with the amendment that it, it be in compliance with staff suggestions. Is there anybody in opposition to that? All right, let's go ahead and vote on it and then uh, this council member, okay, hold on one second. Council member Dago Faring. Actually, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm going to call on Susie only because she rarely talks, and then we'll go to the others. Council member Dago Faring. Okay, um, so I wanted to add an amendment to this as well um, to make a motion to direct staff to um, require all current and future development proposals in listening to that once it goes through the first and second reading, that'll be done by the end of August. I feel, you know, in the meantime, you know, we still need to protect these areas. So if we're passing this tonight, I would like to, starting as of tomorrow, have all future, current and future proposals be under this new um, LDC requirement. Do I have a second? The only, the only problem is that in order for a law to be created by this council, we need a first reading and then a second reading, both the regular session. And then after that second reading, the law becomes effect 10 days later. So I'm not opposed to your idea. I just don't see how there's a, I mean, we've, we've I don't see how it's gonna be possible to retroactively do it, but okay. Council Member Martin. So the sooner we pass it, the better is the moral. Yes. Council Member Martin. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to point out that a version that is substantially similar to this is already in effect. So it's not like um, our riparian borderlands are entirely unprotected at, at, at this point. The, this is, is, is adding in some of the wildlife management plan that wasn't ready, um, but it's, it's going to be okay if we follow the normal process. That's all I wanted to say. Councilmember Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, and, and I'm trying to uh, go through this uh, plan really fast. And it was number three. Did you, was the council recommendation to include the Fort Collins criteria? If not, that's, that's what I would want. So I, I'm not sure I want to, uh, I can't find it really fast on the, it, on the plan. It's it on your seven questions. And I, my question to you is, was your uh, was what staff wanted us to accept was including the Fort Collins criteria? There's a revised version of the Fort Collins criteria, and that was the staff recommendation. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, I just want a clarification on that. Thank you. Then I then I vote for it. All right. There's a motion on the table. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Mr. Burchett, thank you very much. Well done, my friend. Yes, Councilmember Beck. So um, this is for either Eugene or Harold or Don or 
Um, what is the timeline? I know we're in a horrible budget year, but do we have a timeline for hiring the environmental planner and volunteer coordinator? Or is that going to be put on hold until we get to a better, is that one of the things that we're sidelined? Those, those positions are frozen right now. Okay. Um, and as we're moving through the financials, we're evaluating it. I okay. think to talk about just um, so everyone understands the decision-making process. We've talked about needing staff to support operational staff via rangers. We've talked about the need for code enforcement officers and all of these things have to be weighed against each other. That's okay. one piece. The other piece is we don't want to fill positions and then realize six months down the road, we've got a different problem. Right. Okay, thank you for that answer. You're welcome. Thank you, council. Have a great night. All right, great. Let's go ahead and take a three minute break as we open it up for final call. Uh, public invited to be heard. All right, do we have anybody by any chance on the final call? No, Mayor, no one has called in. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Mayor and Council comments. Anybody? All right, uh, Council Member Lago Faring. So um, I just want to remind everyone to wear a mask. I just received word tonight that a dear friend has been tested positive for COVID. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very unnerving. Um, and, you know, I had been in contact with them. So I'm kind of now I'm going to do a little self isolation here um, to make sure that I, I symptoms don't show up on on my fa my family and myself. Um, but yeah, just, you know, be careful, be safe, be kind to one another. I know with the um, 
occurring rallies and protesting, something that was, I got an email that was really upsetting um, in just how people are interacting with them, with each other. I think I've seen a lot of, um, you know, just some postings about um, some of the rallies occurring that they're carrying assault rifles. You know, really, <laughs> you know, what is the intent? So really look at, you know, impacts that we create when we are interacting with each other and just, you know, be kind and be forgiving and be patient. Um, that's all I have to say. All right, I guess I just, the only thing I'd like to say is uh, our, our community on Monday lost, a, lost a, an asset, somebody who I considered a good friend, um, Allen Ginsborg. Um, I'm not going to blame his death on anything um, other than obviously a feeling of despair and hopelessness. And um, he, uh, uh, it's rare, I think, that uh, men and women in, uh, in, in business, um, you can point to somebody and say they always kept their word or they were just, they, they, they were just on the up and up. In all the years I'd worked with Alan as a city council member, then as mayor, um, I was also his neighbor commercially. I was on the third floor. He was on the first floor. Um, he kept his word. Um, you might not have liked his projects or the, in, or the industry he was in, um, but he was, he was honorable and he was smart. He was a good family man. And uh, he uh, uh, gave a lot to this community and will be sorely missed. So my, my heart goes out to his, his widow and his children and um, uh, city, city council and the city of Longmont um, just want to extend our, our condolences and, uh, and our appreciation to the man who was in his Allen Ginsburg. So um, anything else? All right, Harold, do you have anything? No comments, Mayor Council. All right, Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right, then with that, we have a motion to adjourn. Councilmember Christensen. So moved. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, it passes six to uh, six to, to nothing with Councilmember Peck uh, absent. Looks like she fell asleep. All right, we'll see you guys next time. We're done. Bye.